We'll start early. Don't tell Sacramento. Whatever you do, you'll get in trouble. So I'm going to bring the meeting to order. We, uh, we the board was met in closed session where no action was taken. I do want to, before we begin our formal presentation, there's um, cards in the back. If you have any public input, that's number G on the agenda. Please fill out a card and bring it up here to Ms. Martin. If you want to talk on just a general item that's not on the agenda, or if you want to talk on an item that's on the agenda. If you want to talk about an item that's on the agenda, you can choose and just indicate you can either bring it forward under item G, which is public input, or if you want to wait until that item is on the agenda, we'll, we'll call on you that way, okay? So tonight, we uh, just to tell you what's going on. It, we're going to have our, our, just a moment, our color guard presentation from Martin Luther King High School, the Navy uh, Junior Reserve Training Corps. And uh, we also have uh, a young man from High Grove Elementary that will be leading the pledge. And I'll ask him to come up right now, Jose Barrancas. Jose, come on up right to that mic. And then the color guard's going to come, and we, we t just wait for them, and we'll go. So let's, let's invite the color guard to come on forward. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chief Macias. Appreciate it. You know, that, uh, that program right now has three young people being considered for uh, appointment to Annapolis. So it's an excellent program up there at Martin Luther King High School. So Mrs. Locke Dawson, you, you have a young man for us tonight? Jose, come back up. I told you to stay there. Go on. So everybody, if you didn't hear uh, Mr. Hunt, this is Jose Barrancas, and he is a fifth grader at High Grove Elementary. And the first thing you notice about Jose is his smile. Turn around and show everybody your smile, Jose. <laughs> it is beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> From the start, he's been outgoing and sociable, and he's quickly made friends at High Grove. He came to High Grove as a newcomer in the third grade. With unwavering positivity and generosity, he goes out of his way to be helpful to classmates and staff. He works diligently on improving in all subject areas and perseveres even when content is difficult for him. It's a good quality to have. Now in the fifth grade, Jose continues to be helpful, exude positivity, and work hard to achieve his goals. Can we please give Jose a round of applause? And Jose, I'm going to come down, I'm going to present you with the certificate, and we're going to get a picture, and then I'd like you to introduce your family members that are here, okay? Thank 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Mrs. Rock Dawson. Jose, I hope, I hope you, will, you and your family will stay for the performance. We have to go. So, next up, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, the audience to the Fremont Elementary School Choir, and uh, take it from there. Where's our If your parents want to come down closer to take pictures, you're not, you're not, a, you know, we're not, don't be scared of us if you want to do that. Oh, they're done. Just one. How about if we're here for Fremont again? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yes, and, and thank you, Ms. Uh, I'm, you're going to be leaving in a moment anyhow, so with the parents of those young folks stand so we can recognize them, and thank you for coming all the way up to Fremont. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know you're going to collect your child, but thank you for being here tonight and, and for allowing them to provide that wonderful entertainment to us. So many possibilities. <laughs> Mr. Martin, can you work that into your speech for us? Okay, thank you. I knew you could. Brent, would you like to do this? Didn't you? I'm going to turn this over to you. 
Huh? Oh, she's not? I don't know. All right. Yeah. We now have a, a special recognition. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, of a, a young man who, in our, a teacher in our district who uh, has received an honor. You, I think it's now again called Riverside City College, isn't it? Yes. So we, it says community here, but it's back to what it was when I was matriculating there. So uh, we're very pleased to uh, recognize him tonight. And to do that is our assistant superintendent, uh, Kylie Diabara. Thank you. May I have Casey Van Brock please join me at the podium? As Casey comes up to join me, I'd like to let you know that most recently Casey was just a honored. He's a four-time All-American at Riverside City College, a first for a male aquatic athlete at the college. He was honored for not just swimming, but water polo too. He was at Riverside City College from 2002 to 2004, inducted just recently in 2016 under the category of male athlete. Casey is a graduate of Riverside Poly High School, where he won two Interscholastic Federation High School Water Polo Championships, and in 2001 earned All-American honors in swimming. His success followed him to RCC. There, he dominated the opposition as a water polo goalie. He set single season 356 saves, and that those who know anything about water polo know that that's an amazing career. His career save records during his time as a Tiger his 727 career saves are still a college record. In addition to earning All-American honors, Casey has a two-time All-Orange Empire Conference selection in water polo, and he is equally as competitive in swimming, earning All-American title 2003 and 2004. He then transferred to the University of Redlands, my alma mater, where he has success followed him there too. He was a two-time All-American and Skyak Player of the Year in water polo, and in 2006, he earned the name University of Redlands Male Athlete of the Year. He graduated magna cum laude, on top of all of this, with a 3.75 grade point average, earning a degree in mathematics, and he came back, well, then he went on and earned a master's degree um, in education at the University of Redlands as well. But then, best of all, he came back to us in Riverside, where he now resides, and he teaches at his alma mater, mathematics, and that's Poly High School. So Casey, we wanted to congratulate you, and we wanted to honor you, because not just did you accomplish all of this, but you've elected to come back to where you were a product of and give back to us. And we're very proud of you, and we're proud of this honor that Riverside City College was able to bestow on you. So with that, we would like to recognize you with a certificate of recognition on behalf of the board and the Riverside Unified School District. So thank you. Yeah, I was going to say with uh, the board, I think Casey's not waterproof, so be careful with it. <laughs> Well, I didn't share that my son idolizes Casey, and he doesn't even know my son, who is 12 years old. You know, Casey, that um, Mr. Lee, uh, fellow Polly Bear, nominated you for this, and the board was very, very cooperative and wanted, very much wanted to do it. So now we have our high school representatives uh, who uh, represent their high school and will come here and talk to us about what's happening at their campus. And first from John W. North is Lizette Garcia. Welcome, Lizette. Good evening, uh, Mr. Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and members of the board. My name is Lizette Garcia, and I am a senior at John W. North High School. Um, I am involved in AVID, MECHA, and the United Student League. It is my pleasure to be North High School's representative to the Board of Education for the 2016 and 2017 school year. 
This year, I will be updating you on events taking place on North's campus and keeping you informed on our progress, um, <coughs> excuse me, progress made towards achieving the LCAP goals. Uh, I will begin with LCAP goal number one, which is to provide high quality teaching and learning environments for students. Um, I'm very excited to say that we will be uh, remodeling our bathrooms in the administrative offices, <laughs> the arcade and the 300s. Um, we're also getting some new technology. Um, the district has provided new laptops to replace um, uh, teacher computers. Um, we will also be getting uh, newer computers in the library. Um, as well as 50 additional Chromebooks. Um, LCAP goal number two, we will prepare all students to be college, career, and world ready upon graduation. Um, this week is very special because we are celebrating our second annual Pathways Week. Um, this promotes career awareness and encourages students on campus to further their education uh, through guest speakers and presentations from their own teachers. Um, Mayor Rusty Bailey visited today, and as, as well as uh, school board president, Mr. Tom Hunt, who are welcomed. Um, and we would also like to give a special thank you to Mr. Hunt, Dr. Veruk, and Ms. Locke Dawson for attending. Thank you very much. Um, we've also had FAFSA and college presentations. Um, this is our fourth annual higher education conference, which was held at North, um, where students and their families were invited to fill out the applic uh, federal application for free student aid with their families. Um, we will also be having an AVID mock visit. It took place today, um, this morning at 7. Um, it will help prepare us for our next visit on December 6th. And I would like to move on to LCAP goal number three, which will be to engage students, parents, and the community in support of short and long-term educational outcomes. Um, this year, we were very lucky to have, have sent 12 members from the United Student League, Renaissance, and the Multicultural Council to attend a summer leadership conference at the University of California, Santa Barbara. They learned leadership lessons through real life experience, keynote speakers, and by sharing ideas with students throughout California. Um, those students who attended the summer leadership camp also took what they learned and applied it to our leadership retreat. It is our second annual. Um, it was held in North Gym uh, on August 12th from 5 to 12. Uh, students, it included 100, over 125 students from all of our leadership groups on campus. Um, they gathered to bond, receive leadership training, and create goals for the year. We created our goal, which was unity. Um, and we were also honored to have our keynote speaker, Ms. Rucker Hughes. Um, and our ultimate goal was unity. We wanted to connect our staffs, students, and community um, through kindness, communication, involvement, recognition, and school spirit. We were also very lucky to house Jiangmen students this year from our sister city in Jiangmen, China. Uh, there were 44 students along with two staff members. They had a six night stay and performed in a cultural assembly with students from both North and Jiangmen. Um, student leaders also hosted a freshman assembly on September 20th, where mentors checked in with their ninth grade students and also invited them to a tailgate and football game against Moreno Valley High School. Uh, we have monthly meetings um, with, in between the Inter Club Council. Um, they, each representative from a club is given information and w given ways to share ideas on student involvement. Uh, they also are supported by LCAP, which helps them um, increase their membership levels on campus. And lastly, we have our 52nd annual homecoming, which was sponsored by the United Student League. Um, it was North of the Jungle. Um, the activities included Spirit Week, a dance, tailgate, football game, and a tailgate. Um, we were pleased to say that 600 students did attend our dance and 700 to the tailgate. Uh, this has been my report. Are there any questions? Well, thank you. Is there any questions for Lizette? No. How about them Huskies? That's great. And you got a big game this weekend, looks like. Yes, we do. Rivalry week. Rivalry week. Yes. So that, that's, that's outstanding. Yeah. And thank you for the shirt. Thank you for the shirt. Yes. Thank, thank you very much, Lizette. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of rivals, um, we have from Riverside Polytechnic High School, Michelle Bolus. 
How about, how about them bears, huh? Good evening, President Hunt, Superintendent Dr. Hansen, and members of the board. My name is Michelle Boulis. I am a junior at Poly High School, and I am pleased to present you with a report of what our school has been doing in the past quarter throughout these LCAP goals. Now, to meet LCAP goal one and providing our students with a better environment, our school is currently undergoing renovations to replace the HVAC system. While this does reap the benefit of a better air conditioning system, it proves to be a challenge for our classrooms and teachers as individual classrooms must relocate to a set of portables behind the school. Also, there's the noise factor, which is very distracting in class. I speak from experience. To meet LCAP goal two, um, to prepare students to be college, career, and world ready, programs such as Puente, AVID, and our AP Academy are all meeting this goal. Our AP Academy is in its second year of uh, its process, and that academy is designed to encourage students to only take AP classes in the majors or fields they are planning on going into in college. This year, we will be more interactive with students by going on field trips. Our AVID program will be hosting its second annual college and career fair, which is strictly student run, and that will be taking place on November 17th. Our Puente has been proven to be successful already, as four of our seniors have already been accepted into college, three of which on athletic-based scholarships, and one of our seniors has received the Puente Statewide Scholarship. To meet the LCAP goal three, um, which is to fully engage our students, parents, and community on our school campus, we have hosted a back to school night, which took place on September 13th. Their students and parents were invited to visit classrooms and speak with teachers. And that night was also very special to us because we reintroduced our alma mater with the help of our principal, Dr. Rowe, and uh, Mayor Rusty Bailey. Um, our homecoming was last weekend. It was our 129th annual homecoming, mm. Poly Pride Worldwide themed. 90 student nominees participated in our homecoming court. And we pride ourselves in being one of the only schools in Riverside, if even Southern California, to still have a full parade with street closures and floats. Our theater will, be op um, will have opening night for their new musical, Shades of Broadway, this Friday, November 4th. Come and check that out. Last weekend, students hosted their ghost walk right in time for Halloween. Now, I could stand here and continue to tell you all the great achievements that my school has done in the last quarter. However, a very dangerous statistic has been discovered through a student poll. Seven out of 10 of the students enrolled on our campus do not believe that their tomorrow will be better than their today. Our administration has successfully identified this through a school-wide student poll. And to combat that, our principal has created a principal's cabinet to figure out the issues on our campus, identify them, and find solutions. This cabinet was designed to have representatives from different facets of our campus to speak up on what these issues are. Some examples include the gap between freshman and sophomore year, um, the pressure of students to feel the need that they need to be high achieving, and some of these solutions that we've come up with thus far is peer counseling. In fact, we welcome any of the members of the board to attend our next meeting, which happen monthly, to come and sit with us and listen to all of the issues that we have and the solutions that we are coming up with individually. One, uh, we are also working with Harvard's Making Caring Common program, which uh, tries to also eliminate this whole issue of student stress and the student-teacher communication gap by creating a sense of respect and, and sense of respect within our community. We also have the senior capstone, where seniors are required to find an issue within the community and come up with a solution. This is a year-long project that all of our seniors are working on, and this is the second year that we are in the process of doing this. Last year, 99% of our seniors 
identified a problem and came up with a solution for it, which means that only two of our seniors did not complete this project. Members of the board, it is my pleasure to have presented you with this report, and at this time, are there any questions? Any questions? Um, well, I have one. I wanted to do, do invite us to that. That's something the board has been talking about. Mrs. Locke Dawson has high schoolers, so she kind of helps bring that to the surface for us. But we'd like to know more about your concerns. I mean, we're, we're equally interested in how our teachers are being pressured and how, certainly how our students are with, with these. Uh, what's the gap year? What do you mean by the gap between freshman and sophomore year? Well, President Hunt, um, at our school we have a link crew program that mm -hmm. helps our students transition from middle school to the rigorous um, environment of high school. And so our link crew leaders are successfully helping their freshmen out by leading them throughout the campus, helping them without, out with their classes or anything like that. But what we're finding at our school is that when students do fall and don't end up graduating, the problem is their sophomore year because there is no one guiding them in their sophomore year, in that 10th grade year. And so although they do have that leadership um, and help throughout their freshman year, they have no guidance within their sophomore year. So we're trying to work on doing something to eliminate that. Very good, thank you. And Mrs. Locke Dawson has a question for you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for bringing up things that are important, not just all the rah-rah stuff. I appreciate hearing about it. I just wanted to know, have you guys started implementing your um, peer counseling? Not yet, that's not yet. currently, in the works, um, we just completed a student survey last week, mm -hmm. and I believe by our next meeting, we should have something uh, done. Good, okay, because you have at least one board member that's very much in favor of that program, so, and hopefully we'll get the other four on board too, so, and thanks. Thank you, and once again, I invite any of you to attend our next meeting. Um, just contact our school, and you absolutely can come, give us your input, and listen to us. Now, Michelle, I don't know how you voted, but I, I would believe you're in the three in, of ten thinking your, your future looks pretty bright because from up here it does. We thank you so much. Great report and input, and thank you for the interchange. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. From Ramona High School, Alexa Angulo. That's a familiar name. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you, she, could, she could have the last name Rodriguez, and I could tell the face. So very good to have you, Alexa. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Tell us what's going on with the home of the Rams. All right. Well, good evening, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and members of the school board. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here representing the Ramtastic Ramona High School. <laughs> so Ramona has had a thrilling uh, first couple of months with back-to-back -back school events and numerous athletic victories. Starting off our third week of school, Ramona celebrated our 60th year with a homecoming carnival, parade, dance, and um, game to welcome all students to come out and participate. Uh, new to this year, Ramona's USB class distributes a monthly calendar to each student consisting of uh, spirit days, football game, important college dates, and uh, modified bell schedules or any other vital information that uh, any RAM student would need to know. On October 14th, we brought out all students for our Club Rush Assembly for a viewing over, of over 60 different types of clubs that Ramona has to offer. Uh, each student received a booklet pertaining um, where the club can be found, the president, the advisor, and the club's mission statement. And then each student was provided with a worksheet so that they could record information that they learned throughout the Club Rush Assembly. Um, after the assembly, students completed a Google form survey to report on their opinions and students felt that the booklet and the assembly were helpful and were most interested in getting to know more information on um, Habitat for Humanity and Pause for Cause. Also on October 14th, we had an amazing guest speaker, uh, JC Good, who informed us to inform the school on the hazards of texting while driving and it was a topic that was well received to uh, her audience. For the district-wide PSAT day, all 10th and 11th graders, um, every student got the, every 10th and 11th grade student got the chance to get an idea of the realistic uh, testing atmosphere that the SAT holds mm. or establishes. And the 9th and 12th graders, like myself, were provided a, represent, a representation of the program Send Suicide Packing 
with over 1,000 backpacks laid across uh, Ramona's lawn, um, giving a visual image of how many lives um, are taken by suicide uh, by um, the students, by s teenagers, I'm sorry. And then immediate immediately after, a passionate guest speaker discussed the topic and how it um, impact impacted his life. Some of the initiatives uh, Ramona is doing this year is focused on supporting students in their classes by offering a variety of opportunity, opportunities, starting with our RAM Academy, which is an event every event one Saturday every month where students can attend tutoring sessions from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. to make up assignments that they have previously missed or get help, get support by um, college tutors. Our AP Academy is a separate and additional Saturday each month where AP students attend to focus, which AP students attend to focus and um, on their, to get more additional aid on their um, AP subject with their AP teacher. Our Ramona's Tutoring Center is open Monday through Thursday until 4 p.m. with extended hours on Tuesdays, like today, until 8 p.m. in our library. And throughout these days, our center is fully staffed with avid trained college tutors, and the extended day is staffed with uh, our teachers as well. Ramona has had the pleasure of hosting RUSD's 13th annual leadership exchange this December 14th. Six RUSD high schools will be joining us to swap ideas on how to make a positive atmosphere for students while building the essential leadership qualities and characteristics in the process. And on behalf of the student body, United Student Body, I would like to welcome you all to attend. So that concludes my report on the Ramtastic Ramona High School. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy very, very to answer. Very good. Thank you so much. Is there any questions for Ms. Angulo? No. No. Well, we, we appreciate the, the, uh, the input, and I, we know you're doing good things over at Ramona. How did the kids, how did your fellow students uh, react to the, t uh, the person talking about texting while driving? Uh, you think it was a yeah, it was, it was really well, well informed. I went to it, and um, mm -hmm. I really appreciated it. I actually saw her um, on social media before I even saw her um, guest speaking, and I think a lot of students got that reaction too, like, hey, I saw you before on... Um, on like Twitter or Instagram and just seeing her live and giving um, that more personal connection with her and just right. seeing her and and having that um, story going along with it was really moving and I do not her, her story was a did she lose a child or um, she lost both of her parents coming back from her college graduation and she's um, paralyzed half of her body oh. on the left side Yes. That is impactful. That is impactful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us, and thank you for being here tonight. You're welcome. Appreciate thank it. you. Forward to seeing you again. Alexa Angulo. And from the school that has not suffered a loss in their football team this year, Riverside STEM, Franklin Brett Betram. Still undefeated, right, Franklin? Huh? Nothing. Never mind. Welcome, Franklin. Good to see you. Hello, um, Mr. President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and members of the board. My name is Franklin Antonio Bertrand, and I'm here as the Riverside STEM Academy ASB president. And I'm proud to represent my school and t meet with you guys this year. Great, we're proud to have you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, starting with LCAP 101, we have new classes that were added, um, such as AP Environmental Science, AP Literature, Theater, AP Physics. Principles of Engineering, AP Microeconomics, and a lot more to accommodate for the first senior class. Yes, the first senior class. We're very excited. Um, new teachers were added uh, to teach the new classes that were mentioned, such as Mr. Barry Walsh for our Physics and Math, Ms. April West for English Language Arts and Theater, and Mr. Matthew Stanfield for PE. LCAP Goal 2. We now have UCR tutoring available for students for the second year in a row. To go along with the first in your class, we have three different types of diplomas. The first is a regular diploma. Second is a diploma with a STEM certificate. And the third is a scholar's diploma. So it provides many choices for students to choose from. Mm -hmm. We also, uh, um, like I think it was Polly, we have a capstone program, I'm one of the participants, we choose a, pro a problem to solve, and it's a year-long process. Oh, very good. Yeah. Um, LCAP Goal 3. 
Our leadership groups, ASB and Link Crew, went to a synergy conference to better understand each other as a, and become a stronger team. There were problems, you know, we're teenagers. And we, I, I believe personally, if I'm gonna run a team, I want every team member to get along correctly. So we just went and it was a great experience understanding one another. Mm -hmm. uh, we have developed a house system like Harry Potter, but with scientific names like Mendel, House of Mendel. <laughs> and um, this serves not only as a homeroom, but also for a way for inner class relationships to be formed. So it's more of like everybody's one as a family. That's the kind of culture we like to promote here at STEM. Um, and we're continuing uh, STEM works as it's important for our students to have time to go to teachers and then uh, go to clubs or under enrichment programs that we have at the academy. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. Uh, we also have more we keep on adding to our school. So now, since we don't have sports, we have eSports, which is like video game competitions. Oh. Not as brutal, but you know, I guess the job done. Uh, we also have comedy sports, another sport. Classic Despians, which is our theater club. We've also expanded social media to reach more students and parents. So now STEM is on Twitter and Snapchat. Since we don't have a tra traditional football team, we had a football tournament to substitute, substitute for a homecoming game. My team lost, but you know. And our homecoming, even though it was small, it was great as always. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a great time. And wrapping up everything, our speech and debate team was performing extremely well in the first tournament at Cajon High School. They actually swept a whole bunch of uh, rounds. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very good. And they are the only team that represents their school nationwide. Really? In our USD. Yeah, wow. That's, yeah. Did you know that? Oh. We're very proud of our speech and debate team. So now with that, I would like to open this up to questions. Wait, are you a senior? Yes. And so what, what are your plans uh, next um, year? I want to study architecture. My dream school would be Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of, that's, yeah, I dream that school too. That's, that's a good school. Good, yeah, good you. number three in architecture So you're, you're filling out your applications now? And yes. And doing, doing your essays? Yes, and all sir. That. Mrs. Locke Dawson has a question for you, Franklin. Oh, you've got the House of Mendel. You didn't say what the other ones were. There's nine of them. Um, oh, can you just give me a few? I'm just curious. Okay, Mendel, Einstein, Bohr. Um, As in Niels Bohr? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Dar Darwin. Yeah, Darwin. <laughs> Those are the that's ones okay. I, yeah. I just wanted to know. That's yeah. good. So it's all prominent scientists and mathematicians. Yes. All right. Yes. That's very cool. And are you in Mendel? Yes. Okay. So you got <laughs> sorted? Yeah, we got sorted. It was a process. They had us choose our uh, interests, and that was just to categorize us. So now we have people that are good in math, science, engineering. Uh, uh, so it's just a good blend of people. But no hat, right? No hat? No. Okay. <laughs> no. That's great. I, I, now I got it. Thank you for explaining. I was kind of trying to figure that out for a moment there, but I know. Right? Yeah. Um, Franklin, thank you. And, and just one more thing. What's this? It's video game sports? Yes. So what, what video games are you guys, and who are you playing? We're, pl I think we're playing against Arlington. Oh. Yeah, and um, we have League of Legends and a game called Hearthstone. Okay. Yeah. Do you, get a, do you get a Letterman jacket for that, or is it <laughs> I mean, we get a Letterman jacket for our speech debate, too, so I mean, anything's up for it, yeah. Franklin, thank you for being here tonight. We, thank we, you for we'll enjoy me. hearing you this year. Thank you. You know, our student uh, board member is actually in traffic, so he'll be here in a little while. But uh, I want to thank you for, for coming, and I know the board appreciates very much hearing about the campuses and getting a better understanding. Please do invite us to your, your group. Uh, just send a, a note to Beth Martin right over there, if you would. And uh, you can stay for the exciting meeting ahead with all the possibilities, or you can go home and do your homework if you'd like. Or, but it's, it's up to you. You're welcome to stay. But we're going to call our district. Well, before I call the district superintendent, say so don't walk out on him. If you're going to go, you should go. But okay, all right. You, I feel like I'm throwing kids out of the room or something. It's terrible. Huh? Okay. You want to do it now? Okay. I would like the boards uh, okay uh, to Dr. Farouk has uh, since we're meeting on a Tuesday. To avoid Halloween, uh, 
he has a class he teaches tonight at UCR. So Dr. Farouk is, is uh, kind of, this has been his um, subject matter he's carried for us. And so with your approval, just by acclamation, I'd like to move items K, 1, 2, and 3 forward. I'll be right with everybody? Okay. So, Can you take a vote? all in favor signify by, by saying aye. Aye. All right, there we go. All right. Thank you, Dr. Or vote up here if we need to. Okay, if I now we get that. Okay, so let me go to K. Well, I'll go the old fashioned way. We'll do that now or before consent. We'll do it after my report, right before consent. Okay. We talked about it. I got it right here. One, two, and three, move one night before after Tim Martin. Okay, we'll do it after Tim Martin, right? So now we'll have the district superintendent's report. Thank you, President Hunt. And again, I, they left a little too soon, but I'm so proud of Lizette and Michelle and Ale Alexia and Franklin and the other student board members that reported last time. It's just wonderful to have them come and share with us and to see the growth throughout the years they are with us. As you know, last Thursday we held our RUSD State of the District luncheon, and we had over 400 people from the community and within our school district that was there. And I'd like to thank the communications department, the planning team, board members, community leaders, students and parents who made this such a great event and I can't begin to tell you the number of positive comments that I received from folks that were there, the followed up texts, the follow up emails. It was just a, a great day for RUSD and so thank you again for to the board members for putting us in position to tell such good news such as uh, what we did last last Thursday. Coming up on your calendars and we'll give you a reminder but on Tuesday, November the 15th, that's two weeks away, the California Department of Education will send a team to visit Raincross High School to determine if they will receive the model department or the model uh, continuation high school recognition award. You'll recall that last year Lincoln High School received that award and each year the CD honors 20 to 30 alternative schools. And as I mentioned last year Lincoln High was honored and this year we're hoping that Rain Cross will follow suit and receive that recognition. And on November the 15th, there'll be a chance for board members and executive cabinet to go meet the visiting team. And uh, Mrs. Martin will send you an invite if you can come that day, we'd love to have you. And on, along that, with other good news, RUSD's very own K2 Institute received a successful on-site validation and is now an official 2016 Golden Bell Award winner. And congratulations to the Instructional Services team led by Judy Furman. And this program will be recognized at the California School Boards Association Annual Education Conference during the Golden Bell Awards Luncheon, which will take place on Saturday, December the 3rd, after CSB conference from 11.45 to 2. And again, we'll be sure to put, put that on your radar. I'd love to have you come and join us there. And that team will have a chance to show and tell our K2 Institute. And continuing on with good news, King High School, Earhart Middle School, Miller Middle School, and the STEM Academy have all qualified for the 2017 California Gold Ribbon School Awards Program. Now, you have to be invited to apply, and then you turn in an intent to apply, and you have to fill out an application. You may recall that the Golden Ribbon uh, School Program is the old California Distinguished School Program, and so we wish those four schools the best of luck as they complete that application process. As I mentioned, this school recognizes that California schools have made exceptional gains in implementing the academic content and performance standards adopted by the State Board of Education. And so we'll certainly let you know if any of those make the final cut. And then I'd like to extend once again my appreciation to all the Board of Trustees for last Thursday. It was a busy day as we had the State of the District but that afternoon. We had our board workshop and to spend time with each of you as the trustees at that workshop. I'm just very grateful because the board had a chance to really take a look at the upcoming priorities and settle in on some key indicators of priorities going forward. And I'd just like to re review those publicly. Very clear, give particular attention to our English learners to ensure that we are absolutely closing the current gap that exists. Second is to complete a comprehensive, long-term, district-wide visual and performing arts plan. Third is to continue our work with UCR to plan a STEM school 
on the UCR campus and four uh, continue to work on creating, rolling out and implementing a professional growth system for our employees and last but not least uh, work with RCC to explore a middle college high school for example um, where, when, cost, concepts, contracts, just begin those conversations. And so again, thank you board for being so clear. Had a chance to share those with cabinet members and we look forward to coming back and updating the board on those priorities going forward as well as the great work we continue to do in other areas. At this time, I'd like to uh, have Mr. Garcia, Assistant Superintendent, update the board on a partnership we have with the American Heart Association and Cal Baptist University as we are teaching several of our students this year, certifying them in CPR. Mr. Garcia. Yes, good evening, President Hunt and members of the board. So thank you to President uh, Hunt's request uh, a couple of months ago to pursue the possibility of offering CPR as a um, uh, course or uh, uh, lessons for our students. We have entered into partnership or we're entering into partnership with the American Heart Association, as Dr. Hansen mentioned to provide hands-only hands CPR training for our middle and high school students, particularly our seventh and ninth graders. We are going to, we're in the process of developing a memorandum of understanding with the American Heart Association uh, this, this month and to purchase some training kits that will be utilized by them and other staff to provide this training. In the months of February through March, we were, we we're going to train all of the PE teachers because these, uh, these trainings will take place during the PE courses uh, for seventh and ninth grade students at all of our middle schools and all of our high schools. Uh, implementation of student training will take place um, through the PE classes and they'll, they'll be administered by three different groups. One will be the American Heart Association staff. We have trained uh, instructors who will be uh, participating in that. They will also be uh, arranging trainings for and overseeing and collaborating with two other groups. One will be the volunteers from Cal, Cal Baptist University's School of Nursing and they will be helping out with the training of the high school students, the ninth graders. They will also be collaborating with Ramona High School's biomedical CTE pathway students in order to provide the training for our middle school seventh grade students. So, and this training will all coincide with the American Heart Association Stroke Month Promotion and Awareness, which is in the month of May. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. And I'd also like to invite, uh, well, before I go on, just we're grateful to the American Heart Association for providing this training. Uh, can you imagine the thousands of kids that will be trained and can save lives throughout the community and things such as that? And to hear that the nursing program at CBU and their nurses or those in training are going to be partnering with this. The, again, as we mentioned, the state of the district, it's these kind of partnerships. The school district, American Heart Association, the California Baptist University's nursing program, we're grateful to the dean there for making this happen. So we're exciting and we'll report back to you. Last, I'd like Assistant Superintendent Tim Walker to give the board an update on what you're going to uh, hear. You read about it maybe this last weekend, but a mental health center here in our community. Mr. Walker. President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, members of the board. In the early 90s, AB 3632 identified the responsibility to provide mental health services to school-age students rests with the Department of Mental Health. For 30 years, school district worked collaboratively with the Department of Mental Health to provide programs and services to students who qualified for special education and were in need of mental health support. While Governor Schwarzenegger was in office, AB 3632 was repealed and all services related to the delivery of mental health supports to school-aged children was passed on to school districts. RUSD contracted with the University of California Riverside to provide assessments and mental health counseling to students with mental health services in their IEPs. Internally, the Special Education Department began to plan for the district to employ staff to provide these services. With the addition of Dr. Charity Plaxton Hennings, the district took steps to hire psychologists to deliver services and perform assessments. Beginning in July of this year, the Special Education Mental Health Department began to develop and is now serving students throughout the district at all levels. Dr. Plaxton Hennings is the administrator overseeing the expanded services, amongst many other responsibilities. In exploring a facility to house the growing department, the special ed office in association with the business department, operations department, and facilities has located a building at 3637 Arlington Avenue. Um, there's a 
overview of the lease up of uh, the place where we're looking um, right there. What's not up there is down the street is the CRC. This building has first floor space available, suite A and A1, that will work well in accommodating a growing team that will provide all services in the area of mental health. IUSD is exploring a lease with the property owner and accommodating the department for a period of time until the, the uh, pupil services and special education department can be housed in district facilities. I want to note that educationally related mental health dollars that we receive from the state can only be spent on educationally related uh, services and other associated costs. I want to thank the board for their support in the special education department's internalization of these services like other areas such as the intensive behavior intervention specialists that we brought in uh, to go away from our dependency on non-public agencies. IUSD is building a team that can provide for the needs of our students while also being fiscally responsible. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Walker. And so as we get closer to taking a look at that, I don't know if you realize, but that is a building across from Shamel Park. And we're just exploring uh, the lease and our CBO is uh, involved with this and Mr. Walker is involved with this. And as mentioned, only the mental health dollars that now come to us versus the regional center can be spent in this way. And so there'd be no money spent out of the general budget, if you will, except for those that are coming from uh, us uh, regarding this mental health. So we'll update you as we go forward and just want to have you hear that this evening from Mr. Walker. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen and Assistant Superintendents Walker and Garcia. We appreciate those, that input and, and update. Uh, now we have uh, public input. I have one card, and that is uh, from a familiar name, uh, Dr. Arthur Murray. And Dr. Murray is going to give us an update uh, regarding his granddaughter, Paris, in, who's in special ed here at RUSD, or I think. Good to see getting you, Art. Getting old, getting old. Yeah, we all are. Uh, let me just pause just for a moment, um, and um, certainly um, pull the uh, mic up a little bit. All right, just to board president, other board members, and uh, Dr. Hansen as well. I, I, I stopped by uh, this evening uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to tell on your superintendent. Uh, he happened to visit my church, and he talked about Measure O and did a wonderful, wonderful uh, job uh, and talked about, you know, what, it, what the benefits uh, are and uh, also had indicated that there uh, would be a, a citizen committee uh, oversight uh, of that process. And I want to say, uh, Dr. Hansen, that uh, if you haven't selected that committee, I certainly would be willing to uh, serve on that committee. Uh, as I sat there and listened uh, to the uh, high school reports, I, I kind of went back uh, uh, because I used to be a counselor at Ramona High School. And uh, I just thought about how we used to even do scheduling, arena scheduling. and. Uh, uh, nobody talks about that anymore, uh, but uh, I happen to say 40 years, I mean, that's 40 years ago, um, it doesn't seem that long at all. I know to some that might seem somewhat antelopian, but it didn't seem that uh, uh, far back at all. But now, let me hasten. Um, uh, I came because, you know, a lot of times when there are issues with young people, we come and we complain to the board and you never see them again. And I'm here to tell you that over the years, it's been probably 26, 27 months, a couple of years now, uh, and uh, Paris, my granddaughter, uh, she is doing well. Uh, she is happy, um, and she is getting what we call educational benefit. We front-loaded her services early on, speech, OT, all of that. and. Uh, she has definitely benefited by it. Um, Mr. Walker and I have bumped heads, but I'm telling you, um, he not only crunches numbers, but he has certainly been a strong advocate uh, for Paris. 
And I certainly appreciate that. Um, we had one of the best IEPs this year. We haven't completed it, um, but it's amazing. Uh, that one should have been on video so we can train others how to conduct an IEP meeting and what it means to have parental input and how important that is. And uh, I just stop by to tell you I appreciate uh, the work uh, that the district is doing, the support uh, that Paris uh, has been given. When I was a high school principal, um, one of the things I was always trying to figure out was how to get positive press because, you know, the press is always looking for negative things. I happened to be at a large comprehensive high school and it had 13 different gang factions on that campus. Mm. And so finally I figured it out that, uh, that the way to do that is to write your own press releases. So <laughs> I came down today to tell you that thank you. I want to thank Mr. Walker and his department for the work that they have done and the support uh, they have given Paris. And uh, she's growing up nicely. It's amazing uh, how well she's doing. And I want to thank you. God bless Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. We appreciate right. your time here. All right, very good. What, what church was, was his church you went to? Amos Temple. Amos Temple. You didn't convert him? I mean, he preached. Oh, well. <laughs> I bet he did. Yeah, thank you. That's good. I, oh, oh, good. So uh, we're now going to hear from uh, our Riverside Association of School Managers. Their president, Victor Cineros, is um, going to report and give us an update on the recent accomplishments and activities of RASMA. Victor, good to see you. Good. Uh, good evening, uh, Board President Mr. Hunt, Dr. Hansen, members of the board. Um, very nice to see you guys all again. Um, I just want to give you a quick uh, update and report on what RASM is currently working on. Um, just this last week, we sent out a request for nominations for the AXA Administrator of the Year. And today, a new, very well put together newsletter went out from RASM. Uh, Dr. Iconi at North High School uh, puts that together in collaboration with the RASM board. But I uh, was asking again for nominations. Uh, last year around this time, I was telling you about the conference that we were going to attend uh, in Sacramento. This year, the conference is in San Diego. Uh, last year, we had Mays there as um, a recipient of a, an award. This year, we have a student, uh, Lisa Nance, which we watched the video last time. Uh, so in the upcoming weeks, uh, we'll be compiling those nominations and moving forward. Hopefully, we have more than we did last year. Uh, that's always our, our work. And uh, hopefully we have again another student representing the region, uh, representing our USD and RASM. Um, on the same note, we hope to see uh, many of you, or if you can, stop by uh, Thursday, November 10th, uh, which is when the student, Lisette Nance, will be recognized in San Diego. Uh, we're able to award a uh, few scholarships beginning of this year. Um, one of our administrators, uh, was able to take up on this scholarship, and that is to attend the uh, AXA Leadership Symposium uh, in San Diego this November. Um, also, congratulations to Alex Senar. He's an assistant principal at Liberty. Uh, Alex was selected to be the representative or liaison chairperson for RASM's new position as a liaison for equity. Um, AXA is looking to expand in the area of equity, and so now they've designated um, a person at the state level, at the charter level, and now um, at the region level as well. Uh, many legislative initiatives continue to be lobbied and developed in conjunction with uh, equity, access, diversity, educational rights, uh, and students, and uh, RASM supports um, our region. The region supports our state AXA and we continue to move forward in the, the right direction for students. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Victor, thank you. We always enjoy your reports and, and the work that your, your, your wonderful group does. Thank you. We wouldn't have those golden bells without you all and the next gentleman's, the people he represents coming up. And uh, so we're excited about that. Appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you, sir. All right, next up we have, uh, uh, speaking of teachers, uh, Tim Martin, President of Riverside City Teachers Association, to report on recent activities and accomplishments of RCTA. Mr. Martin. Good evening, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and members of the board. 
Two years ago, at about this same time of year, in my comments to you, I suggested that we hit the pause button. Last year, I made comments based on an NPR segment on teachers who go out to their cars and cry. This year, I would like to revisit my remarks given at the beginning of the school year at the district-wide professional development day held in August. I have never done leftovers before when speaking to you. However, I felt strongly about this in August, and I feel just as strongly in November. I want to share those comments in light of the instructional decisions, plans, and programs being implemented now throughout the district and at individual school sites, or those being considered for the future. Here are my comments with a slight tweak or two for this evening. A good friend of mine has been talking the last few weeks about the importance of keeping the main thing the main thing. So I'd like to remind us about keeping the main thing the main thing. The main thing is what happens each day between teachers and students in their classrooms. We are all important in the lives of children. Certainly their lives are better because of the service our psychologists, nurses, speech language pathologists, librarians, and counselors provide them. All of us know how important it is for every school to have a good principal and for our district to have thoughtful and effective leadership. And none of us doubt the role of our classified colleagues in taking care of our kids and the value of us all working together. Yet, we must surely recognize the unique power of a good teacher in the life of a student. Teachers day in and day out when the classroom door closes or students line up in a gym or on a field have the opportunity and responsibility to help our children be successful in learning and in life. Good teachers do that. This is the main thing and we need to keep it the main thing. For those of us who are not classroom teachers, what does it mean to keep the main thing the main thing? To put kids first, we must put their teachers a close second. We know this from experience and research supports this, that next to involved, caring parents, it is likely that a caring, effective teacher is the most important person in a child's success in learning and many times in life. There are a lot of excellent teachers in our schools we should listen to them and we should trust them. And whatever it is we are asking of them and whatever it is we are doing for them should provide more benefit than burden. I do listen to them and this is what I hear. The two professional development days at the start of the year were good. During August, September, and much of October, teachers and students were glad to have cooler classrooms. Many teachers feel the positive impact of generous staffing at school sites. Third through sixth grade teachers are pleased with the English language arts textbook adoption. Teachers at all grade levels in the core academic subjects believe that a state adopted textbook series, like the one adopted for English language arts, should be the primary source of curriculum and district designed units of study serve only as an optional supplemental resource. Another concern is that the pace of instructional change with the number of new district and school site programs is for many negatively impacting morale and for some, instruction. There would be broad support for efforts to reduce, coordinate, and manage new instructional programs at both the district and school site level. Despite this, I frequently hear from teachers and others who are pleased with the good working relationship between RCTA and district leadership and share a belief that this must be good for our kids. And for you, Mr. Hunt, the possibilities are unlimited. 
Thank you. I have no doubt you could do that, Mr. Martin. Thank you, and I assure you the board has, has heard you, Mr. Martin. We, right, we appreciate you. your input very much. All right. We'll now move to items K1, 2, and 3. Introduce yourself since you're not Lynn Carmen Day. I am not Lynn Carmen Day. So good evening, Board President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, and members of the board. I'm Kirsten Frosto. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Program Development. You have shown interest in formally including student voice in matters concerning the school district and previously took action to add a student member to our Board of Education. Tonight, we bring you a resolution that authorizes our student board member to make motions in addition to their ability to cast preferential voting with the exception of closed session matters and those items relating to employer and employee, employee relations. So before you tonight is a resolution for your consideration on this matter. Thank you very much, Director. Um, do we have any comments from the board, uh, Dr. Farouk? <clears throat> Thank you, President Hunt. I, I just wanted to mention that uh, from the training that Dr. Hansen and I uh, attended in Sacramento, is very few districts in the whole state have given their student uh, board members the full uh, capacity, authority that the California Ed Code provides. So uh, I, I think this is a really great opportunity to send a message about how we value student uh, empowerment. Any questions? And uh, we probably need to include uh, Uber for our student member because, <laughs> uh, for, uh, but we'll, we'll, maybe we can amend that in later. Doc, Mrs. Lock Dawson. I just was wondering, there's nothing in there, a provision of a tie vote and what happens if it's, now we have an even number of board members adding another, so what do we do? Their votes don't, don't count on the actual record. Correct. It's advisory. Uh, where, where is that? that I it's in the original, we, we, which we adopted. It's, they refer to it as preferential v votes. Oh, the policy. Yeah. Okay, because I'm looking at the I'm looking at the resolution. So, in the event so. of a tie, the, the tiebreaker is the elected. <laughs> yeah. The majority of the elected. No. Okay. So it's only advisory then. Yes. Correct. So. It's under number five in the board policy, which is the next item. Okay. I was looking at the resolution. Which Ms. Lagdas and I was driving that. home from our last meeting, and I it suddenly hit me too, and I had to. Uh, trying to get over Dr. Hansen, I got to get over Dr. Farouk, and he reminded me. So okay, no yeah, thanks. But, that's that's good to know. No, I just I didn't right. see that. So thank you. With no more discussion, do I have a motion on this uh, recommendation? I'm so moved. Second. So I have a motion and a, a second to adopt for the Board of Education of Riverside to adopt Resolution 216-17-30, authorizing student board members to make motions. I think it's more than we got, Patricia, when we first got on the board. If I remember, but please yeah, vote. Now, um, you weren't here. And that carries with Alex being an abstention. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I believe you'll stay for K2? Correct. All right. So in addition, we are bringing the formal revisions to the board policy that describes the role and responsibility of the student board member to reflect your desire to authorize them to make motions in addition to their current ability to cast that preferential vote. Um, this is a first reading. However, you may take action on this matter this evening. Good. Mrs. Alavi has a question for you. Well, it's just more of a comment. Um, I had a chance to just look this over, and I think that, that several things need to be rewritten. Uh, I, in item number one, it said, uh, each high school may select a student. That's not true. Um, they don't. The high schools don't select. They, they may nominate. Mm -hmm. But then it, it, it isn't clear to me from item one that that's following exactly what we have been practicing because we haven't allowed every high school to do it every year. We're alternating. Okay. So I think we had a, I think number one needs to be completely rewritten. Also, I was curious about one year terms. Yes, it's a one year term. However, they're really only serving a three month term. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know if we want to adjust that at all. And then on number five, it says preferential votes shall be cast prior to the official board vote, and that hasn't been done. If you notice the way when Alex uh, votes, his vote is separated from ours, but he's voting at the same time. So I don't know if that needs to be adjusted. I, These are the two areas that I had problems with. 
We'll, we need to talk. I had him voting at the same time because I just felt it was calling them out. Well, I agree, I, but yeah. I'm just saying that then it yeah. doesn't align with the policy. Yeah, it doesn't align. We, I, I, re, I tell you, it's difficult up here to make that young person, okay, you vote first and kind of out there, and then, yeah. then we'll all make the real decision. We know what a tiebreaker looks like. It's, it's the electeds. It's the majority of the elected. So if there's a six, it's going to be the three that, of the electeds that voted that way or, or whatever. So uh, Dr. Farouk. So I, I agree with uh, Trustee Alvey's uh, comments. The, the thing I would mention about the, the phrase about the student board member voting first, I think we should just rephrase it as that, that suggested. The spirit of it is that because they're an advisory vote, if they're voting at the same time, they essentially, and their vote doesn't actually count, it, it makes it irrelevant. Um, so, but I think it's only practical in, in, in uh, instances where they're, we're discussing something that they are, are very opinionated about and they want to send like a specific message. And so typically from, uh, at least from my experience, they would actually vocalize that in their comments as opposed to vo necessarily voting first. So it's, it's more about the spirit of what that entails. Yeah. And if you don't recall, uh, Dr. Farouk was a student board member in, in uh, the, the Arupa across the river district. We have uh, Mrs. Locke Dawson. Um, well, and now I see why I didn't see it. I think I, I think it's sort of um, obscured by the language that's in there. I would just state it. I would just state that it doesn't, the, the board, the vote does not count. I mean, just, just flat out say it because it, it's sort of wrapped in this very flowery language and that's why I, I kind of missed it. But I, I, it doesn't, it's not a bad thing to say that. I think we should just flat out state it. So, just because I think it's other honor. people may have the same question. It's an honorary vote, I think. Mrs. Alaby, thank you. And just following up on that, um, then I should, then I would suggest that we say that the that the student board member may be asked to cast their vote ahead of time, but that so that we might request it right. at, at those periods yeah. of time when it's. Sure. Important, like for instance, on the calendar where they do so much work and they've gathered so much information mm -hmm. and so forth. So let's rewrite number one and number five to reflect those things, if that's okay. And we'll, mm -hmm. I'll get back with you about that, and mm -hmm. we'll bring it back to the board. Certainly, we'll take that input. In. Can we can we get this done by our next meeting on the? Sure. Second reading. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much for your work on this. Sure. Thank you. All right, we move on to K3, which is Mr. Walker, Assistant Superintendent, Pupil Services. But I see Dr. McGuire is going to handle the ball for him. Good evening, President Hunt, Good evening. Dr. Hansen, and Board of Education. Before you tonight and provided to you previously in preparation for this meeting is a resolution which, if approved, proclaims the Board's intent to implement restorative practices district-wide. Uh, restorative Practices offers proactive approaches to relationship building and responsive processes for de-escalating and addressing conflict. Restorative Practices has been shown to strengthen school communities, positively impact school climate and culture, and reduce incidents of violence and conflicts within schools. Additionally, Restorative Practices has proven to be an effective alternative to suspension and a viable way to repair harm and diffuse conflict while maintaining a pro productive relationships within a school community. Uh, as both a framework and a set of practices, restorative practices prioritize re prioritizes relationships, mutual accountability, and inclusiveness as a system-wide normed response to discipline. Restorative practices impact social emotional development of students and positively transform school cultures and climate. Uh, the research shows that suspensions and um, expulsions under restorative practices are reduced, uh, classroom disruptions are reduced, office referrals are reduced, conflicts, fights, violence are reduced, um, continued or recidivism of behaviors is reduced, and out-of-class time is, is reduced. Uh, also, disproportionality of suspension and expulsions in subgroups is reduced. It increases accountability, engagement, and a sense of belonging, social emotional competence, and problem solving skills and time on task. Uh, additionally, uh, restorative practices has been called out in the education code in the area of dis as an uh, other means of correction in the area of student discipline. And as a vehicle for improving stu student culture and engagement, restorative practices is also recognized under the state's emerging accountability framework 
as well as the U.S. Department of Education under Every Child Succeeds Act and their accountability expectations and the Department of Justice's biannual uh, data collection for student discipline, particularly in the area of disproportionality of, of suspension and expulsion. And finally, I would like to publicly thank Dr. Farouk for the leadership he has given in this area and for his work to connect us with um, network possibilities in the area of restorative practices. So it's the uh, district's uh, desire that you approve tonight this resolution for restorative practices. If you have any questions, I would be free to answer those. Well, Dr. McGuire, we do, and thank you for your work on this as well. Uh, Mrs. Locke Dawson. Two questions first, which I think we can answer quickly. Dr. Fruk, does this answer the concerns you expressed to me earlier this year yes. regarding? Okay. They, they, yeah, thank you for asking. Okay, yes. good. Um, and then could you please um, just very quickly take me through a case of how this will work in practice with a student, say, who is, I don't know, um, speaking disrespectfully or not, or doing something in a classroom. Can you, can you just well, take me through how, how the policy will be implemented on a particular case? Okay, after the training of the staff, okay. there are several levels. One would be using restorative language. In many cases, it's the relationship you build with the children, and we, it's something we, we know to do, but we don't always do. It'd be like an I statement. You know, when you say disrespectful to, things to me in front of the class, it makes me feel bad because I can't teach the rest of the class. In some cases, that will diffuse, okay? So you'd do that. Another would be using um, restorative language yeah, or questions. For instance, as you take the student aside, what just happened? You know, what were you thinking at the time? Um, what have you thought about since the time you, you disrupted the class and said that to me? Mm -hmm. And what do you need to do to make it right? Now, if it were bigger than that, you can go into what's called a restorative circle, where you would basically ask the same questions and the people that have been offended would be there. And unlike punitive systems, where we give a suspension and expect the behavior to change, the student takes no ownership because it's been done to them. So in this process, it gives the student and those that have been suffered the harm a chance to um, take ownership and accountability what happened and what needs to happen to make it right. Doesn't mean that, let's say if it was a fight, that the student's not gonna get a consequence and that consequence mm -hmm. may be suspension, but the student's gonna have to be brought back in and to be restored and to take ownership for that. So that's the kind of process. And there's another one, I, one of the things that's been powerful, like we've, we had seven schools trained and um, EOC has gone you know, hog wild in this particularly in the area of commu um, community building circles. And what they're already seeing at EOC is kids that have been at EOC for years and were whining, complaining, talking back, you know, and they wouldn't talk up in class. As a result of having consistent community building circles, they're gaining voice. They're becoming engaged in the process at school. So, and they're not mouthing off as much. So we've already seen some effects just with that preliminary use of uh, restorative practices. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to see how you envisioned it um, because sometimes the policy is different than how it is mm -hmm. enacted on Correct. the ground. Correct, and, so and again, this is, this is a resolution for your intent. We follow up with details later. Dr. Farouk. For um, thank you, President Hunt. Uh, so I, I want to begin by uh, acknowledging and commending Dr. McGuire for all of his efforts. This is a very complex process and involves uh, you know, uh, facilitating training efforts with our, uh, with our employees. It's about fostering a culture throughout the whole district. And, it, you know, it involves outside the, of the district stakeholders. I know you recently met with the Eastern Reconciliation Group. And so it's, there's a lot of moving pieces, so I, I you know, want to commend you for that. Um, th I just wanted to make a couple of comments. One is that this is specifically to address an unfunded state mandate that has been placed on uh, all California schools. I don't know the, the exact, do, do you know well, the exact? Basically, it's a part of the accountability procedures. We need to improve student engagement. To do that, specifically restorative practices has been called out in many cases. And even to the extent I mentioned uh, the Department of Justice, we do a data collection every year. And they publish every school in the, the countries disproportionality in discipline. Um, Riverside is like 
many, um, most of the, of the nation in that when we do suspension and expulsion, our black students, our foster, and our homeless are disproportionately suspended and expelled. And in schools that have implemented this, it's made a difference. So, so that was actually the next point I was going to mention. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, no, no. But, uh, but to to that point, uh, I think you know, from a from a governance perspective, this presents a liability. I mean, one from a humanistic perspective, we need to do something about that. And I think with us, we're not approaching this from complying necessarily with the the mandate, but how we can be progressive, and uh, be a leader in this in this effort. But specifically to your point about the data. Unfortunately, the data shows that our district is not unique in the fact that, Af that African-American students foster and homeless disproportionately make that up. What that means, though, f from a liability standpoint is that, you know, the Department of Justice could potentially, uh, what's the it's Office of Civil? It's the Office of Civil Rights, yes. Office of Civil Rights can, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that can create some exposure for us. So this, this is addressing a multitude of things, potentially uh, being proactive on the Department of Justice front. Um, addressing the unfunded state mandate that you just mentioned. And um, lastly, I just want to mention that, you know, it's whatever we can do to have the, that National Restorative Justice Coalition be supportive, there's a lot of support that's going to be needed in this. So, um, you know, happy to facilitate that. And thank you for, for engaging them. Uh, you, he's, Dr. McGuire will be speaking with the, the chief organizer for the National uh, Restorative Justice Coalition soon. So thank you so much. And uh, if, unless there's any further comments, a motion to approve. Uh, thank you. I do have a, another comment from Trustee Alavi. Yes, I, I'm fully engaged in the process. I've been reading about it. I, I understand its, its intent. But following on the heels of what uh, Mr. Martin was just talking about, this sounds like it needs a lot of intense teacher training to, in order to implement this in the classroom. And I wondered. What are the plans for that? Or have we acknowledged the training? Or when is that going to take place? And how is that going to happen? In, in the vision at this point, well, yeah. I, obviously, we have started with some training. We trained 100 people last year. We're going to train 90 more this year. And from the 100 that were trained last year, a, a group is going to get level two. So we've got that started. Yes, it's intense. It takes time. There are, we didn't talk about, there are curricular uses of the community building circles as well. So I can do a, a language arts lesson in a community circle. And that's for another discussion, but you can do that. Um, and getting the planning group together, again, it will be broad stakeholders. It would obviously Im Im include the teachers. It would include, include classified. It impacts the community as well, so community people will be involved. Okay. Because I can put it together, but there's so many pieces, so as Dr. Farouk said. Is there a timeline for this? Is, are we trying to do this on any kind of timeline basis? The resolution is suggesting a three-year timeline. Three years. Yes. So in, incrementally getting it in. You can't so do everybody all at once. We're suggesting that by the end of three years, all our teachers will be trained in this? My hope that would be every staff member would be trained. Every staff member. Because even when we interact with each other, ELC is a good example. They do, their whole staff does community building circles. So, and when you have that language system wide, it's more effective. That's my, my hope. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Farouk. Just uh, two comments to Trustee Alvey's point also. So, we are looking from a very big picture. I didn't want to get, a, get into the specifics about it right now just because it's a little bit premature, but I have spoken with our, uh, the leadership of our California Workforce Development Department. They've expressed to me verbally, it's nothing you know, concrete because it's the governor's discretion, but the, apparently the governor is open to appropriating in his upcoming uh, budget funding where, uh, that our school district could potentially be a pilot or qualify for, where we could actually work with people who have been offenders in the past who have, uh, you know, uh, redeemed themselves and are, are trying to make a difference, and they could actually be trained to be doing the restorative circles work that, that Dr. McGuire is speaking about so that we can really come full circle, and those people really can be most empathetic and effective in uh, facilitating these kinds of efforts. Um, also, e even beyond the workforce component, there's 
uh, is Department of Justice or Department of Education? There are two grants coming up. Yeah. One is we're already working with uh, uh, Loyola Marymount University to get ready for the next release of the Department of Justice grant, which could be a couple million dollars, which is released in May. Um, the State Department, the governor just signed a bill releasing, I think it was the, the tobacco tax, mm -hmm. I believe, money for this purpose as well. And that grant opportunity should come out in January. Yeah, so we're going to be looking to supplement our capacity on those fronts, too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased that we're doing this. Uh, I, in the last nine years, I sometimes vote on suspensions. I just think, man, I'm lucky I didn't get caught doing that. I mean, it's, it's just uh, we need this. Some kids just need a little guidance to put them the right way. Uh, assuming passage by the board, I would ask Dr. Hansen that uh, a couple things. One is that uh, you and Justin and, and all work on uh, a press release letting the community know that we've taken this action. Have a thoughtful quote from me in there, if you would. And, um, and, and secondly, uh, um, I would like you to send this, if you would, to our student reps that, and ask them the next time they speak to us uh, to just give their, you know, working with their own ASBs, et cetera, just give their input on this and let's just have, have their word in it too. But I have a motion for approval from Dr. Farouk. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Alavi. Everyone, please vote. Dr. Gary, ready to go. Thank you for your support. Thank you, sir. All right. We're going to take a quick 10-minute uh, break, and we'll return with the uh, consent calendar. Is that okay?
next item on our agenda Go on. is uh, the consent calendar. These are considered by the board to be routine and, and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There's, there will be no discussion on these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless members of the board request an item to be removed from the consent calendar. Is there any request for removal of an item to be considered separately? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move approval. <laughs> That's all right. Alex? I thought he was going to say I, I know. He, he can make the motion. No. Well, I thought he did. I was told that he was supposed to say I, it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withdraw my withdraw motion. Withdraw <laughs> Go. Okay. Uh, I make a motion to approve the consent items. All right. Somebody note that as an historical first. <laughs> Second. Okay. A little bit of bumpy on the way. Second by Dr. Farouk. Please vote. That was your president's fault. Problem. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Approved. Okay. Excuse me just one moment. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to go into discussion item. The staff will provide the Board of Education with an update on the project prioritization process in preparation for the passing of the general obligation bond this coming Tuesday. Sergio San Martin, our Assistant Superintendent for Operations. Mr. San Martin. Good evening. Good evening. President Hunt, Dr. Hansen, Board of Trustees, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, as we prepare for passing the general obligation bond next week, staff has prepared a prioritization process for you to review and to move projects forward. The process for prioritizing school projects includes a comprehensive and a collaborative progression. The steps and process leading this goal is a dynamic approach and a not a one-fits-all result. It includes defining, verifying, and developing the objectives needed to, to be achieved. The first step of this process is to develop a, a long-range facilities master plan, which, will, which we have completed on January 2016. The next step is to develop a funding source, which we're working with the bond measure, and also a strategic plan. The strategic plan includes a quantitative roadmap describing funds, project budgets, state eligibility, and a timeline. The next step is to form a steering group. This steering group is made up of either a board subcommittee uh, or a facilities summit group. The next step would be to identify focus goals, and these focus goals are developed by the Board of Education and District Support. These may include the overall development of, for example, uh, the goal, one of the goals may be to replace all aging portables. Another goal may be to modernize existing uh, schools. Another uh, goal may be to, to uh, reduce uh, transportation district-wide, and so forth. The next step is to develop also an evaluation process. This evaluation process includes developing or identifying a, a, a project criteria, defining project types, and weighing project priority elements. As we look at the overall process, this model is based on the facilities master's plan guiding, uh, guiding principles that are identified in the facilities master plan. This, this uh, evaluation process that you have here in this slide, it's just a quick overview of how this would look at look like if uh, as we implement the evaluation process mm -hmm. so again first is to develop and identify the focus goals evaluate the project criteria define the project types weigh the project priority elements evaluate alternatives and then propose a, pro a project priority to the board of education all these are surrounded or are identified through the guiding principles. Again, this is a quick overview of how this would work in terms of 
uh, the, the guiding principles identified in the facilities master plan and identifying the types of projects. We have new projects and modernization, new, new construction and modernization projects. As we look at the guiding principles, these are the core standards guiding the design process as we start looking at projects and identifying these, these specific projects. These are these areas as we start designing, they're, gonna, they're areas that we would uh, look at assimilating the, the areas in, in the, the maintenance that are identified again in the facilities master plan, priority, evolution, and vision. As we look at new construction, new construction is defined as scope of work that is new work in, a, in, a, in the district, either an existing site or a new facility. When we look at project criteria, that's an existing condition or an impact generated at a site to promote a demand, a program demand, excuse me. A priority elements and existing variables or variables that raises or lowers the level of project priority. Now, when we look at new construction, these are projects that are, again, their new scope of work. It could be a new facility, it could be replacing portables, it could be um, adding or replacing um, areas in a, uh, in a school site, for example, their mechanical systems, their electrical systems, their plumbing systems, um, and they're all guided would be under the project criteria. The project criteria is, again, defined as existing conditions or impacts generated, generating a site or a program demand. We could be aging of the facility, it could be, a, there, there may be a development, housing development in that attendance area that is requiring a demand for additional capacity. The facilities may be eligible for new construction funds from the state and so forth. Now the priority elements are more specific and the steering group will look at this and evaluate those areas. That may be capacity needs at a specific site or a neighborhood. There may be state requirements at an existing school that need to be addressed. Uh, there may be funding sources, again, either through Measure O or state funding that the specific um, school or area is eligible for state funding. There may be a life safety condition, and again, we would look at the project costs. When we look at modernization, it has a similar process. And modernization is an existing facility requiring renovations or, uh, renovations or scope of work at that existing facility. Um, when we look at uh, uh, an existing facility, again, it falls within identifying what the, the project type would be, or uh, B on that column, project criteria, identifying the project criteria, and then looking at the priority elements. This next exhibit describes a sample project and illustrates that the first that the final design, as we start looking at identifying projects, it must be guided by the guiding uh, principles identified in the facilities master plan. For example, this project, and I know it's kind of small there, but if this is uh, ABC modernization project, the steering group would look at the project criteria, identify those areas on that specific school, and then they would also weigh the priority elements. As this is being developed and as the plans are being designed, we are looking at the revolving or the the, the, the guiding principles will be revolving around that design or that conceptual design that is being decided on. For example, if we're looking at modernizing a classroom, we would, it wouldn't be just a cookie cutter modernizing a, a, a classroom. We are looking also at the, the of course, the maintenance areas on the, on the whole of the school, the parity if there's lack of restrooms, if the site does not have the NPRs at other sites, um, the evolution of uh, making sure that these classrooms also include the components, the infrastructure for technology of today, but also technology of the future, and perhaps even programs that this specific classroom or the school at one point may be uh, offering, like STEM or STEAM and so forth. And then the vision, looking ahead as part of the design to include the vision for uh, that, that re will reflect the overall goals of the, of the Board of Education and the district. And with that, uh, we can go into questions. Let me make one statement. Uh, this this um, 
Thank you very much, Mr. St. Martin, Superintendent. Superintendent. Uh, this was presented to the facilities committee uh, Monday, and Mrs. Allaby and I were there. And one thing, um, I'm speaking to you, Mr. Vice President Lee, is we strongly urge that it, it not be a board subcommittee this first year in particular, because there's this is a cross your fingers, but this is a $400 million bond. We're all involved in it. And so we want the facilities summit group, whatever name we have, to be workshops with the entire board. And that's so we're all involved. And, and again, in a workshop, uh, I want to be able to hear from, uh, with all respect to our district staff, but I want to hear from a principal what, what they may feel about their particular campus is a certain need, because they live with that every day. And uh, so I just strongly want to urge that we not have a board subcommittee on this, but it, it'd be a, um, as many as we have to have, it's very, very important. It's gonna be, the, it's the future of this district, facilities-wise, and uh, it, it'd be workshops. And then we have Mrs. Allaby. And I was just gonna add my two cents to that. Um, we talked about um, the choices that uh, Mr. St. Martin gave us as far as creating a community uh, committee that might evaluate this, but it would be very hard for a community person to understand, um, you know, without being biased towards their school or their area or whatever. And I think that um, the whole board can maintain a great amount of level playing field about those projects. Um, so that the community part should come in. I mean, everybody would be, of course, allowed to come to meetings and speak their minds, but maybe not sit on a voting committee that would make those decisions. Thank you, Mrs. Allaby. Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, Mr. San Martin, okay. with the facility summit group, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, Again, because I know, I know, we, like with the facility, long range facility master plan, we had parent input, we had principals, we had teachers, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my understanding is that the facility summit group does encompass, you know, board input, of course, but maybe people of industry, people from the business community, architects, um, you know, folks that are uh, involved in education and in facilities that know what components are needed um, and have some familiar, familiarity with our district so they know some of that priorities so that we can accomplish as much as we can as quickly as we can. What a facility summit group would include is keep, keep people, keep uh, uh, personnel, as you mentioned, they may be the, the architect or architects, uh, various departments representing the educational side, the business side, uh, the operations areas. It, it, it could also uh, include representatives from specific school sites and even community members and students. Now, the, the only uh, negative side of that uh, is that it becomes a big group, and with a big group, uh, the decision making and recommendations become, uh, they just take longer to get to a consensus, uh, but is representative, it has a, a wide of representation. Okay. So uh, two, two things, one, one for you. So when you, in your previous district, previous experience, I assume, you, I know you've gone through this process before where you, you, you pass a, a bond measure and um, you go down that road that you're, you're outlining here for us. Um, so if you can share that experience with us. And then my question to the two subcommittee members, when you, when you say workshops, is that what you're envisioning that these areas of uh, expertise would come before us at a workshop and share their input. Okay. Mrs. Allen. You're nodding. But that the board would make the decision. What, what we thought and, and is, as Mrs. Alvey was saying, is that we're the elected group. We represent the entire district, but we also have the distinction of having trustee areas. So we're going to be listening with both ears, I mean, to put it that way. And we certainly want all those groups you mentioned, Mr. Lee, to and, and parents and, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, principals. Uh, one thing that was amazing on Measure B was when we, Mrs. Alibi remember when we were talking about pools, one principal came forward and said, we, knew, we were never told, told that pools were on the, on the agenda. We would have asked for one. That was Ramona, in fact. So uh, we want to be sure they're all involved. But if I have no doubt if I invited certain parents, they're going to be advocating 
have you seen the restrooms at my school type thing. So we're the ones to make the decision, but and we're going to have to have more than one workshop, and we and that takes our calendars. But uh, I think we all need to be up for it. Is what it is. Oh, can I add one yes, more? Yes, ma'am. Um, and we already have the facilities master plan, and it's already written. And Measure O monies must go towards that facilities master plan as written in the bond language. Um, so it isn't a question, Mr. Hunt, of adding a bathroom if someone felt like, oh, you missed my bathroom in my school, but rather that, that when you end up finally making that decision to prioritize, that the board makes that decision and that we, that we own it, right? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think now I'm on the same page. I just, we spent a, a year and I yeah. don't know how many tens of thousands or not hundreds of thousands of dollars in putting together that facilities plan. And I'm not saying we have to be married to it for forever, but we should follow it. I mean, it was a good plan. We've all seen it. We spent a lot of time on it. So uh, unless something changes or we hear something better, I don't think we should be deviating too much from what we already have. And uh, I do agree that the board should have the final say on, on the prioritization list. I just think that just like a, a principal or a parent or a community member could be um, passionate about one particular school site, I want to make sure as a board, since we are in trustees areas, that we don't lose focus on um, the benefit of the entire district and the highest need mm -hmm. and focus on our own trustee area and uh, because that's where our voters are coming from. But sorry, I know I still asked you a question about your, your previous experience. Mm -hmm. When, well, we do have a $1.3 billion worth of need that has been, identified, has been identified in the facilities master plan. When you have that magnitude of need in trying to uh, narrow down to a, a priority uh, project list, that, um, that makes it very challenging. Now, with other, other districts that I, that I worked with, that need wasn't that great. It, well, you had a smaller scale of projects that um, it worked well having a facilitator that would um, include or would uh, oversee this facility summit groups made up of different representatives and make that process so much easier. Now the design uh, professionals will be there too because at that point we, wouldn't, we, we uh, had an idea of the specific projects that we were looking at. So it makes it so much easier. But when you were looking at a, uh, a, a need of this magnitude where so many challenges and every project, every site is, is very important, it kind of delays and in in, in, um, makes that process so much uh, uh, lengthy. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, so, Superintendent, would you, you know, one thing the, the public has picked up on, and Dr. Murray brought it up tonight, is the Citizens Oversight Committee. And uh, so when does, when does this group come into play? I'm, and uh, is it first year or later on? And, and how would they be chosen and so on and so forth? Okay. As we pass this general obligation bond next week, we'll have a better idea of when of a timeline. Uh, usually is at the beginning of the school year in January, we'll have an application process. The citizen oversight committee is, will be made up of specific uh, representatives from the community, business people, PTA, parents, and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's a specific uh, group that is defined in, in the law. And, uh, but the process would be they would have to apply, they would submit an application with interest of participating in this, in this committee. And uh, this, super, this, this uh, application or a, a uh, recommendation will be provided to the superintendent, which will bring it to the Board of Education to make that decision. And, and I missed it, but what, what, where would this fall but immediately or so after we're looking at project about list has been done? I or? can answer that. Thank you, you really don't have to have a committee unless you receive the funds and you're starting to actually okay, spend that, it. You so you have up to that right, point right. to try to implement a process to select the committee. And we are looking, I think Dr. Hansen and I talked about maybe a January uh, timeline to upgrade our rating and go out and try to issue and, and situate ourselves in a position to issue the bonds. So the timeline of that spring would be when we would appoint a committee to make sure that as soon as we start spending, as soon as there is a first report, that committee is there to oversee that report. Expand on uh, upgrade our rating. 
So one of the things that uh, we have did, we did one step with our rating agencies to make sure that we are situated in a position where we could be looking at an upgrade. Um, we went up last January um, and met with two rating agencies, Standard and Poor's and Fitch, and um, we're able to uh, put ourselves in a position where we kept our rating, but we, they had a negative outlook because the districts were going into such hard times before. We were able to prove to them that we're in a better financial situation to take that out. So at this point, when if we go up, there is a chance that we could be eligible for an upgrade based on how we have um, handled our finances this year and all of the accolades that the district has done in the year to make sure that the community is supportive. So when that happens, they can rely on people keeping their homes and being satisfied with the community and not many foreclosures and the bonds will be satisfied for the investors. And so we believe that we're in a position where we can actually look at an upgrade. That upgrade could actually mean millions of dollars for citizens of Riverside right. that have uh, property that would be financing this debt and it would save them a lot of dollars on interest. Very good, thank you. Dr. Hanson, do you want to add anything? No, that's okay. All right, then. thank you very much, Mr. St. Martin. We're gonna move on then to Item number 2J2, which is the Board of Education, and getting back to the main thing, the main thing, a report on the mathematics in the district with context of our five-year implementation plan, Assistant Superintendent Antonio Garcia. Welcome. Yes, thank you, Mr. Hunt, and good evening again, uh, President Hunt, members of the board, Dr. Hansen. At the last board meeting, Mrs. Hill reviewed official SBAC test results for Riverside Unified School District in the two areas of English, language, arts, and math. We learned that our results are favorable in most areas as compared to the state and the county. You asked us to continue the conversation and make sense of the data. So we will provide the board with an overview of the causes and cures in two areas. One of those areas is in the area of mathematics, which we are prepared to discuss today. The other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other is in the area of English learners which we are preparing to bring to you at the December 5th board meeting. With us this evening are math instructional specialists, uh, Matt Cash, Teresa Butler, and Renee Lavario. And I'm gonna ask uh, Matt Cash to come on up and he is going to guide us through tonight's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Good evening, members of the board, President Hunt, Dr. Hansen. Uh, we're excited to be with you this evening and present uh, in three main areas. The first is we'd like to show you some data that I think outlines and helps us understand mathematics achievement in our district. Uh, the second would be to uh, talk through current actions we've taken uh, to ensure that achievement of our students in the areas of mathematics is a priority to us. And then lastly, to share with you our five-year plan for rolling out our new state standards and where we are currently at with that plan. The slide in front of you uh, depicts data from our Smarter Balance Assessment, our state assessment, from the year 2016. And it compares growth from 2015, the year prior. Uh, looking at data like this uh, is favorable to see that we do have increased gains uh, across all areas except for in fourth grade. Um, however, one of the things when we look at data like this and compare it is that uh, the third grade students that it's being compared against are not the same students. So in 2015, the students that would have taken the third grade state test are not the same students that took it the year after that in 2016. And so you're comparing two different groups of students. Um, this is great for getting a snapshot of achievement in our district and how we're doing. Um, but I'm gonna share with you some other data and how to look at it through a growth cohort lens. The second uh, slide represents how we are in comparison to the county and the state. And so uh, as you look at it compared to the county, you can see overall uh, we are 4% above the average. And extending all the way into 11th grade, we see positive gains when compared to the county, um, all the way on to uh, our state assessment that the 11th graders take. And there will be more on that in just a moment. 
Obviously, there's room to grow when we compare ourselves to statewide data, uh, but we'll share with you course of action we are taking uh, to remedy that. So one of the things I'd like to share with you is how to look at it through a growth cohort lens. And uh, for that, the example above you is how the state represents the data of an individual student uh, to the parent. And so they get a letter each year that outlines how the student did the year prior and how the student is doing in this year. Now we've only taken this test for two years and so we only have two years to look at, right? And so if I zoom in on what that looks like for a student, you can see right here that it shows the growth of the student's score uh, over those two years, measuring that particular student's growth. We can look at district-wide data in much the same way, comparing growth cohorts and following them through the grades. This slide represents uh, scores from our Smarter Balance Assessment uh, in 2015, following a cohort of fifth, sixth, and seventh graders, and then tracks them into the next year where we see their scores as sixth, seventh, and eighth graders looking for improved achievement. In the first section for 2015, we can see that those grades five, six, and seven, uh, the amount that exceeded the standard was 14%. Those same students who took the test again the following year grew by 3% in that, that area. The level down meet, meeting the standard, there was 18 in 2015, and that grew by 1% in 2016. So positive gains in both of those areas. The two bottom nearly met and, um, sorry, did not meet. That's uh, incorrect uh, on the slide. Uh, those two areas, we want to see negative numbers in those. Those mean that those areas are decreasing and that is a good thing. Mr. Cash, take a question from Mrs. Allaby? Sure. Please. Thanks, just really quickly. Um, you said that they eventually will see last year's, parents will see last year's test scores? They will. Will they? the following year see three years, and the next year four years, and the next year five years? Will they continue to see multiple years, or will it only be compared to the year before? Um, I can defer that uh, to Mrs. Hill, if you'd like. Uh, my, <laughs> my understanding is that up to three years is what they'll show when okay. communicating. I, I was just curious, thank you. We're not sure, <laughs> because the okay. CDE hasn't released their template uh, templates yet, okay. uh, but when they do, <laughs> One comment back from me will be show it longitudinally over time. Thank you. Uh, at, a, at a recent seminar at UCR, um, that, was the, that was the message they gave, that two to three years would be what the parents received to show that growth. Very good. This next slide shows uh, our state test uh, that the 11th graders took. You can see in 2015, 27% were ready or conditionally ready for college, and that in 2016, that number grew to 30%, showing a 3% increase. Now, uh, this uh, state test incorporates the early assessment program, which is a uh, joint effort between Cal State and the California Department of Ed to help identify students in 11th grade that are college ready. Um, I want to note that uh, this test is given in 11th grade at the, end of, uh, at the end of that year. And so even having 9% of our 11th graders score ready to enter college at the end of 11th grade is a good thing uh, with still a year of high school still to go. Okay? The difference is between being ready and conditionally ready. If you score ready, you can enter college and take um, college level coursework without taking entrance exams or having to take remedial classes. Students who test conditionally ready will be asked in their senior year to take additional either ELA or mathematics depending on their score. If they maintain that uh, uh, a grade of C or better, um, then they also have the privileges that were awarded to a uh, student who tested ready. When comparing uh, those scores of our 11th graders across um, our county. If you look at nine school districts that are adjacent or near to us, 
uh, you can see that Riverside ranks fourth in those areas. If you were con con to compare it to the county as a whole of all 23 districts, we would compare fifth. So while that data shows that um, we are in an upward trend, that we are showing gains, um, we would like to see um, accelerated gains much quicker than 3%, right? We're not content with growing 1%, 2%, 3% in these areas. And so I want to share with you a few things that we're doing uh, uh, to combat that. The Hanover Institute in 2015 released a report that identified five major things that need to be present in districts in order for students uh, to achieve. There are a balance of collaborative and direct instruction, explicit strategy instruction, student-centered environments, a variety of methods for solving and approaching problems, and whole class intervention in both elementary and secondary environments. When we evaluated our course program, whether it is uh, the resources that uh, teachers have in the classroom, um, professional development opportunities, um, and things of those, uh, we can check off each one of those five things as being present. Um, they do exist in our programming, they exist in our resources, they exist in our messaging and the things that we do with, with our teachers. Um, one thing that we want to work on is consistent implementation across the district with these items to ensure the success of all of our students. So what is in place currently? I'd like to highlight three of those areas mentioned by the Hanover Institute and speak to those. The first would be whole class intervention in elementary and secondary. Um, we've had specific professional development uh, opportunities for teachers to learn what that is and how to employ those things in their classroom. We've provided them with sample assessments that help them understand the rigor of the standards and what the intent of the standards is shooting for. And we've also provided them with training on re-engagement lessons, which is a specific strategy uh, that targets whole class intervention in elementary school. For a balance of collaborative and direct instruction, again, we've had professional development sessions uh, that teach teachers how to do these things in their classroom. Uh, we have staff developers that go out and regularly plan uh, with our teachers to help them understand how to design units or uh, approaches instructionally uh, to balance these things. Uh, in fact, there is seldom a day I walk into the staff developer's office and see more than one or two of them in the office because they're consistently out at sites supporting our teachers. <clears throat> We've also gone over the instructional strategies that would support this. We have units of study in kindergarten through 12th grade that provide resources that balance both that collaborative and direct instruction model. And then we've, uh, for the past two years through professional development, worked with our teachers on developing structured math discussions in the classroom. The last area of student-centered environments outlined in our instructional guide, we would love to move away from a teacher-centered environment to a student-centered environment. And for us, that means being able to accurately identify the needs of our students and address those specifically through instruction. So in order to do that, we've had, again, professional development days that target those areas specifically with our teachers. Uh, we've incorporated ELD strategies into our mathematics instruction, um, highlighted from the ELD Blue Book, uh, so that those things uh, work together. In K-6, we have a formative assessment cycle that we've began this year where teachers give a pre, a mid, and a post-cycle assessment to make sure that their students, they're aware of where they began, they're aware of how they're progressing throughout instruction, and then they're able to take an accurate assessment at the end of where students ended up. And then we've uh, implemented a universal screener uh, beginning this year as well, which is measured to, or which is designed to measure students who are at risk. All that said, we've done this through uh, an organized plan that we've intended to roll out over five years. Uh, most research indicates that you can't change something overnight. <laughs> and so uh, three to five years is about the going, going time. We aired on the side of five. And so I'd like to share that with you now. In 2014 and uh, 2015 school year, uh, we focused on key shifts in the standards the new standards themselves, as some standards moved from grade level to grade level and teachers weren't aware of which ones were um, being moved, so we made sure we understood those changes. 
And then we dove into the California framework, which is the how. The standards are the what. The framework tells us how to approach those standards and teach those standards. And we spent considerable time that first year of professional development in that area. The second year, we tackled the content specifically, uh, how to teach and go about some of those um, different standards, the pedagogical practices that needed to change and shift, and then provided them resources like task-based assessments, um, center activities, and uh, a variety of alternative lessons that they could use to increase the rigor of the lesson in the classroom. This year, we've moved into uh, providing units of study uh, that do supplement their core curriculum, formative assessments, as I mentioned before, and that universal screener. The reason this is significant is this is the beginning of our third year of our five-year plan. Um, things don't change overnight, as I mentioned, and uh, we're doing well considering um, that we're just in the beginning of the third year. The other thing to note is that the data we looked at previously did not have formative assessment cycles or universal screeners in place for those first two years. Now that those are in place, we're able to identify kids throughout units of instruction, right, how they're progressing and being able to intervene specifically with their needs. And we also have uh, the universal screener that lets us know prior to teaching uh, which students are at risk so that we're monitoring those students and providing effective intervention for them. Next year, we'll move into the area of data-driven interventions. Now that we have formative assessment cycles, universal screeners, and we'll have three years of data behind us, we'll have the data we need to start making some of those data-driven intervention decisions. Um, we'll also be launching an early numeracy program in K through three, very similar to our K2 Institute that just won the award that you heard about. Um, the same way there are very strategic things you must do to teach a kid to read, there are very strategic things you must do to help them understand the way numbers work together. And so we'll be targeting that. And then although we began a shared leadership system this year, um, pulling uh, principals and their leadership teams in and discussing the data from their sites and their specific needs for professional development with their sites and goals, um, we'll begin to focus on those things even more in the coming years. Lastly, in our fifth year, uh, our, our focus will be around uh, focused collaboration, informative inquiry, which means identifying a problem or finding something that you really want to know about what's happening at your grade level or within your class and researching that. And then a guaranteed curriculum. And when I say a guaranteed curriculum, I'm not talking about a textbook or a box that comes from a publisher, uh, but instead the state standards themselves and the framework that tells us how that happens to ensure that all students are receiving that instruction across our district consistently. At this time, I'd like to stop and open up uh, for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Cash. We have, a, we have several questions. Uh, Trustee Alavi. So can you explain to me um, how the integrated math is going? So you, you started it two years ago, correct? And so is it, will it take all five years to get through the integrated math classes? So for integrated math, I'll turn it over to Teresa Butler, who oh, is the instructional sorry. service specialist for Somebody secondary else mathematics. May have a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Good evening. Yeah, we, um, my name is um, Teresa Butler, Instructional Services for Secondary Mathematics. Um, so, yeah, we started the process of a transition. This is now our third year. So, what we, our process was um, instead of just dropping students out of one, our traditional system and putting them in integrated, we, one course at a time. So, t two years ago, um, we stopped offering algebra and offered math one, and then um, last year we stopped offering geometry and offered math two, and this year we, it was the first year we have no longer offered algebra two and offering math three. Um, so we have transitioned, um, and we are still in the process of transitioning. So in, in elementary, um, they've been implementing their standards for three years, um, whereas um, we have teachers for the first time this year um, implementing the math three standards. But, and when will the end of this be? We still have pre-calc standards that we'll be implementing pre next year. So next year. Yeah, and then um, calculus and all those standards are dictated by College Board, so we're not changing those. Um, okay. But next year will be our last year. Last implementation year. year. Correct, okay. for secondary. Thank you. Uh -huh. thank, thank you. Trustee Locke Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. Um, I'm glad to see all these fabulous strategic ways to, I think, improve our math achievement and understanding. 
Um, I guess this, this is a universal question, and it might be directed at Ms. Hill, I'm not sure, but um, you know, this is something we've, the whole country has struggled with, right, is math achievement, particularly in secondary, the, that we lag behind supposedly international students, and often children who are not educated in our system can succeed better on our own math tests than kids that have been taught, right? Um, here in, in the United States. There's, there's got to be a way to figure this out. And I'm thinking of like the University of Chicago Data Center for Science, the big data center. You know, where you're looking at, you know, and we look at how to bring kids up a lot, but what is it about the kids that are doing well? What are, what are the common factors of them that are predictive of how well you're going to do? And, and I can't believe it, it's just that they're all smarty pants and great in math. I think there's probably some common factors to those kids that succeed, and then also common factors to kids that perhaps are struggling. Um, because we do have kids that excel and do very well, you know. So anyway, I just I just wanted to throw that. It just seems like a, a very, and I'm sure the state, I know they, they've got a huge data center and they're doing a lot of analysis on SBAC, but um, anyway, I would just, I don't even know if that's possible, Ms. Hill, but I would just throw it out there. It looks like a good project. We did have some conversations with uh, Ms. Zanzig at uh, University of Chicago with Design Science. Um, so that is, we could, see if they um, background information. The, uh, the design science project at the University of Chicago um, in the summer, they take grad students who uh, take on projects to, uh, you hear big data now in the common lingo. So these grad students um, just take on data projects and analyze data every which way to see what it tells them. So we could, um, it's a competitive process for which project they choose, but we could definitely submit a project. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see if they could just, uh, and I'm sure we're not the only district or only state that's struggling with this, so maybe perhaps there's a consolidating or a leveraging factor with other, other states or, or districts. And I got, I just wanted to let you all know, I got my SBAC results for my two kids because both of them took it, so anyway. it's one sheet, really, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that question, Mrs. Lock Dawson. Trustee Lee. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Cash. You're welcome. Um, a little disappointed you didn't see your presentation, but uh, let you pass. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, my comment kind of goes along with what Mrs. Aliva was saying. Uh, three years ago, I remember Mrs. Butler and and Renee coming to the subcommittee meetings with, with uh, Mrs. Cloud and talking about how we were gonna approach this big change in, in math. And I'm channeling my, my Mrs. Cloud um, and her big concerns. I remember her going back and forth um, about this big chain and how it's gonna disrupt students. And I try to take it from an approach in a long term, right? How, how can long term we solve this problem? It's, it's, long, it's been a long term problem. How do, we, how do we fix it over the long term? So I'm confident with the staff that we have and this strategic plan in place that over the long term, we're still gonna accomplish what we set out to accomplish um, three years ago. But her concern then, and, and my concern still now, is what are we doing with the students who did go through this system um, previously and are our transition students, our students that you know, lear learned certain units of study um, before these standards changed and now are forced to, forced to cope and, and switch. So are we, do we have um, short-term solutions for those students? What type of support systems are we putting in place uh, to support those, those students? Um, and you know, like any transition, it's tough. And we heard over the last two years from teachers and students just struggling, either understanding how to teach the concepts or understanding how to learn the concepts. So, what are our staff developers seeing in the classroom? What are we hearing from teachers? What are we hearing from students? Um, you know, because like you said, the, these, this SBAC is just a snapshot. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we're looking at it and glad we're analyzing it, but I think you can tell a lot by just going to a classroom and, and seeing how students are responding to a lesson and seeing how teachers are responding to their students with their questions. So what, what are you guys seeing um, in real time? Speaking for elementary, uh, is their grade level fluencies. And so grade level fluencies are outlined 
for each of the seven grade levels. Um, uh, for instance, in kindergarten, it's adding and subtracting within five or composing and decomposing numbers, and it builds from there. Uh, oftentimes, teachers experience that the students that are coming in, although they were taught those things, have lost it over summer, right? And, and have some kind of uh, remediation that needs to happen. Um, so in their resource guide, in their units of study, uh, there are specific um, pathways that they can take for intervention. Um, some that include standards-based intervention. You can identify specific standards student need, backtrack where those prerequisite standards came from, and select specific lessons that will teach them those standards. And so that's included in their units of study. In their, uh, in their um, curriculum that they have from Pearson, there is a, um, a kit where you can give a diagnostic to a student and identify areas conceptually that they don't have, maybe fractions, division, things like that. And it will identify um, a series of lessons to complete with them prior to reassessing and seeing how they've done. So there's that as well. And then we also have outlined a um, program for fluency in general. And so teachers can uh, hop on to the resource guide uh, to their units click on their specific grade level or the grade level for the fluencies in which their kids are currently struggling with and pull out daily routines to do with them um, what we call sprints or formative assessments that they can do uh, weekly in the classroom to progress monitor that um, and then also a variety of activities that the students can take home and, and do at home as well that, that target those specific fluencies Mr. Lee, um, just to direct your question uh, about the idea of what's happening in the classroom. Um, my team and I have four staff developers that work directly with me. Um, we've been in all the classrooms um, this year, and except for Ramona, we're going um, tomorrow. Um, and we've joined all their PLCs, and um, you're right, it was a really, really tough transition with our Math 1 teachers three years ago, two years ago. One. Um, they were struggling and working really, 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 really hard. Um, and we were supporting them the best we could, you know, giving them time to plan, giving them time, you know, to go through the units. But um, when you've been teaching Algebra 1 for 20 years and now you're teaching Math 1, um, it's a transition. And so we were supporting them. And now, two years out, the Math, teacher, math 1 teachers, are, this is all their third year, um, they're a lot more confident and feeling a lot stronger in the material. And last year, our Math 2 teachers were going through very similar struggles as our Math 1 the previous year. Um, it was new. They're having to learn the content as well as um, what they knew, the, what they understood students to know previous. I know in Algebra 1 my students came in knowing this, this, and this, and now I don't know Math 1, so I don't know what my students are coming in knowing, and I don't know my own course. Um, and so it was, it's been a long learning curve, and so our Math 3 teachers have seen the Math 1 and Math 2 teachers go through this, and so um, are more and more um, working to um, learn what's coming up um, and also appreciate the work that the Math 1, Math 2 teachers are doing and understand that Math 3 is going to be a transition year, um, but they're optimistic about it. And, you know, I, ha I was speaking with a Math 2 teacher from Arlington um, and he was saying, like, oh, Math 2 this year is going so much better than it did last year. And, you know, it, it was mid-October when I was speaking with him, but he was very optimistic about the approach and, and the course. He's gone through it once, he's seen those students, and, and now he has a little bit more information on what, what the students know coming into the course. So they're very, I think they're very optimistic about um, the transition and where we're going with our program. Mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you very much. Dr. Farouk. Thank you, President Hunt. Uh, great job, Matt and Teresa, on this presentation. I just have a couple of comments. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Hansen mentioned earlier that our, our board placed it a priority on uh, English learners because we were able to kind of segment. We want to see where there's opportunities to make, you know, strategic approaches to have the greatest impact upside on um, improving student achievement. With the data that you presented, is there any way to have a better understanding of, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be, it could be socioeconomic, racial, or, what, or whatever the case is on how, where the areas of greatest need are from the general categories of, you know, the grade levels and the, all the students? Yeah, if you'd humor me for just a moment, I can show some ancillary slides that might help oh, you sure. understand that. Let me get back one slide. There we go. 
So these are uh, our EL students pulled out in that same growth cohort that I shared with you before from fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. Um, and you can see that the amount exceeding the standard was zero, which is not acceptable for us, right? But in met the standard, uh, there was a gain of 1%. Um, in nearly met, 4%. And that uh, the has not met, the lowest level, um, is actually decreasing. And so that is a positive sign. When we look at subgroups, we can see that our socioeconomically disadvantaged students that met or exceeded the standard went up by 4%, that our non-SED students went up by 6%, our Latino students went up by 4 African American students went up by 4% as well, and then Asian students 11% while whites. Uh, increased by 5%. And when you look down and segregate those out by Latino SED and Latino non-SED, you can do that for each subgroup. Mm -hmm. And we can see that socioeconomically disadvantaged Latino students still had a 4% gain, that non-SED Latino students had a 4% gain. SED students from African American uh, families, 2% gain and non-SED African-American students showed an 11% gain. Asian students from, uh, that are SED, 7% uh, gain. Non-SED Asians, 7%. Uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged white students, 6% gain. And non-SED white students also showed a 6% gain. So, so this is fantastic, uh, the data that you showed. I, I would just say for future reference, definitely, you know, include that in the report and if we could get a copy of that as well i think yes, that'd sir. be helpful and one one last comment too is uh i'm just curious if uh like with dean thomas uh you know uh college of, Ed of education at ucr if there's if, if it's if there's any opportunities to have faculty be doing special research or, or studies on some of the work that we're doing um you know we should we should explore that we happy to look into that thank you trustee alavi thank you dr Farouk. Thank you. I was um, going to ask Alex a question, actually. Uh, I think, Alex, you probably have had more traditional math, right, as you've come through, because you're a senior, so you are probably always had the traditional math. But have you noticed at the STEM school, the kids uh, behind you taking the integrated math, and have, have they been talking about it at all? Um, OK. So like at STEM, um, I don't really think, like, I don't know, I haven't really um, exactly seen, well, I wouldn't say I haven't seen much of a difference, like, in terms of the curriculum, but, like, I, I didn't really, uh, oh, I just haven't, like, seen their curriculum at all, really, um, because, I, I, like, just the way my classes go and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I can um, look into that a little bit more so I can give you a better answer next time. But... Um, just like on like surface level, um, it seems like <clears throat> like math has always sort of been like an area like when I did like tutoring and stuff like kids would always go in for math especially, um, and recently like I feel like those numbers have died down a little bit actually, um, but uh, yeah I'm not entirely sure if that's because of the curriculum or anything curious. like that. But I was just curious if it had come up at all. Okay, yeah. Um, I, I could look into it more. I'll let you know. Alex, whenever she asks me a question, I get a little nervous too, so <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. But we're, we would appreciate that answer. I know that, that that's something we're, we're looking to you to help us with. So, they're good. Mr. Cash, good, uh, good graphics, by the way. Thank you. I nice, appreciate that. The one that you, Mr. Dr. Farouk was just talking about. It is so nice to have some that are easy to understand and, and from here or up there, and, and also up there for our audience. Very important. So thank you very much for that report. Appreciate the feedback. We'll move on then. Um, we're going to now move back to the action section. We'll go to K4. Um, and this is a, uh, <laughs> this is a, the Board of Education formally recognized the first week of December as a computer science education week in our USD. We'll be taking a hand vote on this, by the way. No one else got that. <laughs> It, it, it will come. It will come. <laughs> it will come. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, there it is. Thank you, okay. Renee. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Hun, Dr. Hansen, members of the board. Uh, like Dr. H or, Go ahead. Excuse me. <laughs> The item before you is a resolution to formally recognize the first week of December as Computer Science Education Week. For several years, uh, nationally it has been recognized as Computer Science Education Week, where students across the country engage in computer science activities, most notably the Hour of Code, which RUSD students have participated in the last three years. Um, RUSD, as you know, is uh, nationally and locally recognized as a leader in computer science education. From our early days with Google, implementing after-school coding programs for uh, elementary and middle school students, to our partnership with Girls Who, Girls Who Code to help close the um, gender gap in computer science education, to our recent um, partnership with Code.org and the formation of the Inland Code Consortium, a nine-district consortium led by RUSD to bring professional development to teachers around computer science and curriculum to students. Uh, by adopting this resolution tonight, you are continuing that effort uh, to bring computer science education to our students in our USD. Should you choose to do that, and we would strongly recommend that you do. Th thank you very much for that report, uh, Dr. Farouk. I just want to commend uh, Renee, Steve, your whole team. You guys are doing incredible work, and th you're going to start doing the family coding nights, yes. which I think is a phenomenal. Family code group. nights start yeah. this month. Actually, the first one is tomorrow night at University oh. Heights Middle School. We're engaging families and students together. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. I have a motion to approve. And I, I commend you all on the, the way you wrote this. I think it talks about what the heart of this district is, about equity and attracting uh, more participation by females and underrepresented minorities. So I have a motion to approve resolution 1617-33 uh, that would recognize the first week of December as a computer science education week. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Lee. And uh, all in favor, please, please, uh, please vote. Raise your hand. Right. Thank you. Okay, that that carries. The computer says completely. Dr. McGuire, I believe you have a, the next resolution, much more serious uh, actions are first reading, and that is a resolution that the board adopt new policy 5141.52 suicide prevention that is being presented for our first reading tonight. Dr. McGuire. Again, this is being brought to your for your first read, but at your pleasure, you can move to take action on this e this evening. Um, since the three of us came on board a year and a half ago, we saw a, a deep, deep need in the area of suicide prevention. And about a year ago, today, um, under the leadership of Dr. Plaxton Hennings, we put together some really hefty procedures and and processes for dealing with kids, both as intervention, prevention and postvention. Um, in the meantime, both of these two doctors here have taken the time to train the counselors, the psychologists in, in this process. In the process of doing that, um, we discovered there was no board policy in regarding um, suicide prevention. So we come to you today with, a, I think it's been a six month work to get this to you, um, with our recommendation for a suicide prevention policy. Any questions for us? We've got the experts up here. I yes, Mrs. Lock Dawson, thank you. Um, so including that then, I, I know you have the suicide prevention handbook that you've written, I think. So is that just since this time too, that you, since you came to the district, that did we not have that on board before you, you came? We did not. We, okay, hmm. that's good. I don't know if everybody's had a chance to look at that, but it's a, it's a good, it's a very good document that, um, I think you use it for training, right? Some of, or do you do training with that? I actually do the, um, all the training on that. Um, so we, in fact, we just finished retraining all of our school counselors on the use of that manual and also on the data collection piece that we're doing this year. Um, anytime you roll out a new procedure, you wanna see if it's working and how effectively it is. And so uh, we have a new data collection procedure that we're doing this year so that we can track how effectively that tool is being used across the district by um, each group that's using it. Um, and I think one thing I just wanted to mention is, um, you know, so much of the suicide prevention these days, sort of conventional wisdom and a lot of um, processes tell, tell, direct our students to look for signs, right? Or they tell the teachers to look for signs like depression, 
withdrawal, sullenness, but as you all know, there are many students that do not have those symptoms at all or signs, and so I think, I think we always need to keep in the front of the, of the, of our minds that, that um, are, uh, sometimes it's the kids who are the most outwardly happy and the ones that you would never, ever think of. These are the, the kids that are involved in everything and they have a smile on their face and they're the ones that are under so much pressure and so much private pain. So there's, I know there's got to be better ways to identify those kids and help them. And, and I think a lot of the um, suicide prevention efforts too have, uh, you know, these suicide prevention hotlines and you can call, but that puts the onus on the potential um, suicide victim to reach out, and they often, at least in students, don't do it that way, right? But they will in social media. So I think a lot of times just training their friends to notice when they reach out and say things, it's not dramatic, to take it seriously. And I just wanted to bring that up. I'm sure you, you are aware of those things. If I could comment on that, I went through our data um, that we had collected up until yesterday afternoon to look at the ways in which we were identifying students that were at risk of suicide. And we're getting that data in a variety of ways. We get it from peers that have identified. We get it from um, essays kids have written and dropped little hints, and then the teachers mm -hmm. pick up on it, and then they refer to one of our mental health folks on the campuses. So we are, I feel very good about the fact that while we still have a lot of room to grow, we are getting that data coming in from multiple different sources um, and people really being sensitive to those kinds of clues that are out there. So. That's good. And I just, one thing, want to finish with a compliment. We had our principal summits the other day, and uh, I think I can speak for the board when um, every single one of us was told by the principals how happy they are to have the SAP counselors mm -hmm. on campus and how happy they are with the SAP program. So thank you very much for making a difference. A really wonderful program. Thank you, Ms. Dawson. Trustee Allaby. I'm trying to find exactly where I read this. Oh, I, I was going to kind of following up on her question, um, the first line in under intervention, which says, when responding to suspected suicidal intentions, district staff shall act only within the authorization and scope of that employee's credential or license. Does that mean that you don't want teachers? I, I, if a student comes to you as a teacher or, or another cl a classified employee, that they're not supposed to help? This I, it just, that, particular sentence made me sound like okay. it's like you were making sure they don't do it. <laughs> well, that, that language, after we had put together the policy and then the governor signed into the law a new bill, which was AB 2246. That language is in AB 2246, and my understanding of the intention of that is um, these two people are more equipped to work, I mean, I can identify as a music credential, a, you know, a general administrative credential, students that need help. But when it gets right down to the, the actual intervention and the follow-up, my credential doesn't fit that need. So I'm not certified to do that. It would be more somebody like these two or our SAP counselors or psychologists that do that more intense. And that was my understanding from the law. We also had that language checked by our council to make sure when we responding were doing. to suicidal intentions, district sh staff shall act only within the authorization and scope of that employee's credential. Sounds like you can't do anything. Sounds like if well, I'm the scope of I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. You. No, I'm I'm just saying it just is worded in such a way as to make it sound like a teacher couldn't or would should not almost as if you're not allowed to intervene and, and certainly you want everybody to intervene, so, don't you? Yes, and under my credentials, I have the responsibility to intervene. And but my a teacher wouldn't. No, as a teacher, I'm speaking from my music credential oh. and my elementary credential okay. right now. So I have a responsibility to intervene. And that intervention would be maybe a listening ear because that's within right, my right. credential. Okay. I can do that under my credential. Okay. But when it came to the actual counseling, that would be somebody else. And having been in a situation where I had a teacher express at lunch suicidal, as a principal, suicidal ideation, two of us who weren't credentialed were counseling for two hours okay. until we got somebody into the room that could move this teacher to the point of, of moving beyond her plan. 
I see what you mean, and you explained it well, and I'm not sure that I got that from the reading that. So maybe it could be worded differently or something. I don't know if we, the language can, is such that you can't change it. We can change the language as long as we keep the intent of the law. Okay, I would say that you, you should have a, a line that says that teachers or any kind of school staff, you know, should be listening here. Uh, I mean, I, I, I assume it's just like when you hear that, when you see that a child's been hurt or uh, that you report it, right? It's a, it's a, a reportable situation. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with this, right? right. Well, I have a couple of comments. Just a couple of comments about that. One of the trainings that um, we as the mental health um, folks overseeing mental health went through was the uh, county's assist training and their model looks at a person walking in off of the street regardless of credentials education or whatever being able to walk through somebody through um, you know working through suicidal ideation and just being that listening ear and that model and that's one of the things that we're really trying to increase awareness of is that everybody is eyes and ears on a campus everybody is involved with that but even when you move to the level of working with one of our psychologists or one of our SAP counselors the model that we use is that we always ask for two folks to be involved with that process because the very nature of working with some a student who's suicidal creates a crisis in your own um, professional um, role and so we ask that you always have two folks involved so that in that way we're working off of each other and you're using the professional um, training of each of those people in that situation to just really increase the effectiveness and the ability to respond in those situations so it's a model we're following all the way along so in the same way that we ask teachers to kind of go to the next level and get somebody that has additional training despite the fact that they are you know very capable of being that listening ear we're also asking all of our mental health folks to do that as well okay well maybe maybe everyone else will understand this and maybe it's just it's just me but I would certainly add that line about everybody on campus being eyes and ears or something like that. That's nice. I will add that my daughter's very small private school of 300 kids just experienced a suicide this last week. And it can happen, and it was, again, can happen out of the blue. This was in, in speaking to Mrs. Lock Dawson, this was in a child who was on a suicide watch or had any way did, indicated that they were disturbed or unhappy. So you just wonder who, who might have noticed something, right? Thank you. On, on that, uh, uh, on the first page, last, last paragraph, I, I'm glad we're talking about promoting a healthy mental, emotional, and social development of students, including but not limited to the development of problem-solving skills, coping skills, and self-esteem. Uh, Mrs. Lock Dawson and Mrs. Allaby were describing young people that are, what do they look like when they're suicidal, but I think they look like all of us in the beginning before they, they can't cope anymore. So what is your thoughts on, and I hope that it would look, Mr. Garcia, that it would, it would begin to be, take on a role of just part of our curriculum, Dr. Hanson, but what about, describe to me how we're going to teach coping skills and problem solving skills to help young people not even get to the place where they're frustrated. Well, I'm going to jump in just a second while they ponder that. Part of our discussion earlier when I was up here, those community building circles and those conversations are part of that, where you empower, just like I talked about the EEOC students, empower them to, to voice what they're feeling, empower them to listen to their, their peers, um, would be one step for that. And I'll let these two jump in. So additionally, our SAP counselors do um, social skills groups, they do a more therapeutic groups, they do classroom guidance lessons, and they really develop those based on the needs of the specific schools. Okay. And I'll tag on to that. Our school psychologists um, are working um, and really integrating with our SAP counselors. You see those um, on a lot of our campuses really working as a power team in terms of mental health and what's going on in that respect. Um, and so they're also doing some of that work as well. Um, I think it might be important to share with the board some of the training that, some, that our SAP counselors and psychologists are going through. I think 
one of the things that really informs that coping and those kinds of social emotional responses is so many of our students have significant trauma in their background and that's one of the real focuses of our teams this year is really doing um, training in recognizing trauma in children and how do you create trauma-informed classrooms and that training is actually starting tomorrow for um, a group of both our psychologists and our staff counselors. Well, I, I just, and I appreciate all those answers, and, and that's good. I think, and this is more of a policy about a death com four kind of situation. Uh, I want you all to start thinking about, and just me, and I'm going to voice this again, is that if we can't, in our curriculums, begin to teach young people how to problem solve. I don't mean math, but I mean problem solve your girlfriend breaking up with you. Problem solve too much, too much math, too much homework, too much you know, dads, mom and dad are divorced, and how do you begin to help them to things that we get gain, I guess, with gray hair, though I still have problems at age 61, so, but I've gone through a few things, and I said, okay, I remember what, how that went. They're young, and, and so how do we catch them young and begin to teach them some of that is what I'm asking. I'm not asking you to answer it right now, but I'm asking you to think about it, and for Dr. Hansen to think about it, and I know I'm listening very well to what Mr. Martin was saying about putting more on teachers, but how can we include this vital part, we, we talk about we want world ready, I think it's, we, we say on our, on our standard, we want world ready young people. It isn't just the academics, it's can, how do you cope with not getting the job? When you get a, how, how do you cope with rejection of the prom date? What, how do you cope with just the stress of being 15 years old? Which is, if I remember it well, it was, was stressful. So, uh, Mrs. Lock Dawson. I was just going to, thank you, Mr. Hunt. I was just going to ask Dr. Shans, you told me about a program, perhaps you can share with Mr. Hunt. You did, it was a, like a brown bag seminar or something, you, or brown bags you did on Shamawa's campus, or you had, perhaps it was with eating disorders or something, I don't remember, but you were doing um, Friday afternoons or some, they were informal lunch things. You told me about that. I no, you can't that remember. Might have been was it you? Sorry, somebody did. So I think one of the things I get that the we two you mixed up all the time. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I was just because I know it was an example maybe to share right. with Mr. Hunt that of some of the skill building that I know sure. you have done Thank proactively. You. I think one of the conversations that we have begun to have is how do you do that and push that out to other groups other than initial our target groups and so in my previous districts one of the things that I did is I actually did a brown bag lunch thing with our um, IB students we had an IB program at one of the high schools where I was a psychologist and it was our international baccalaureate students that had our highest rate of suicidality because of the pressure mm -hmm. of that program and the um, you know, they weren't sleeping, they weren't eating. So the first things that we did is we brought in food and we fed them and I went through stress management and just how to cope with expectations and those kinds of things. And so um, that ended up being a preventative thing as a school psychologist that we went in and did as a preventative way to address that. And those aren't um, sometimes your typical groups that you target initially. Um, and that's something that we have had some initial discussions about how do we roll out um, what we're doing to larger populations and more groups of students. So that may have been an example floating around at some point. <laughs> I think I just remembered what you're thinking of. I, I don't remember referring to it as a brown bag, but I think it was a lunch bunch kind of thing that Shema was doing with um, either the assistant principal or the school counselor. And they just invite kids in and have really friendship building time and anybody is welcome and they started off with a very small group and they grew quite a bit larger and just welcomed everybody in and, and taught kids the skills that some of us take for granted of, of how do we make friends, how does that work, what do we do, what do we say in order to invite people into our circle. Thank you. Thank you. We figured it out. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, board members, this is the first reading. Uh, would you, would anyone like to, to consider adopting this tonight or would you like to come back? Well, I was kind of hoping they might soften that one line, but uh, yeah. if they're willing to do that, I could, I'd be willing to go along with okay. it. Okay. Are you willing to soften We'll be happy lines? to make the changes should, yeah, that you are it. asking for, yeah. Don, Mrs. Allaby, and to, as long as it's not changing the intent. Yeah, we'll and um, so I will have uh, Dr. McGuire work on that, and we will get you a draft. You love it when I suggest these things, don't we'll you, Dr. McGuire? 
I'm willing to do whatever you want. I told her early, I, I, I mentioned to Mrs. Alvey earlier that it was St. Paul was lucky she wasn't around when he was writing his epistles, and she would have corrected some of that. But go ahead. He would have shorter sentences. If yeah, he right. <laughs> Get to the I point. Thank you. I'll Do move approval based on um, Mrs. Alley, some second. of the Second. Thank, thank you, you very much. All right. And thank you. I know that the three of you have had a tough year this year, and we've heard, you know, we, we know that we can't appreciate what you've gone through, but we appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that clears it. Okay. So we're going to go to members. This is the meeting conclusion. Members' comments. Dr. Farouk, who has a lot of students waiting for him, you, you're up first. I appreciate it. Uh, I just have uh, one comment. I just, uh, you know, we had a great state of the district event, and I, I think we're all very proud of how that went. And it's just uh, a reminder that the true state of the district is really a reflection of our students' achievement, uh, our great labor relations, the teachers, the s school employees, the management. Uh, it's all of you guys, and uh, I'm just honored and grateful to be a part of this governance team and be part of the RUSD team overall. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Alex? Mr. Rare? Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, sorry for not being here for the first half of the meeting. Uh, the car just wasn't cooperating today. <laughs> um, but I mean, like when I came back, I had motioning power, so uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe next time that I'm gone, I'll be president or something. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, like I agree with Dr. Farouk. The State of the District event was really fun, and it was like really motivational, like to see, um, like, Everyone working together and like seeing what we uh, can, like what we do as a district. So um, yeah, it was just really motivational for me personally. Um, as I'm sure it was for the rest of the board members and for all of you guys as well. Um, but yeah, thanks. Thank you, Alex. This is Alvi, Trustee Alvi. Thank you. Um, I was really excited to hear about the. Uh, community collaboration with the Red Cross for the CPR. Uh, you know, studies that are coming up. And all of these community collaborations, I think, are really great. I was at a meeting today with the Riverside Art Museum as they wanted to create a committee to enhance their art to go which is the program that they're now bringing to RUSD, where they're taking it into elementary school. Uh, they're taking lessons, uh, common core-based art lessons, into uh, elementary school. And I was thinking um, what a good thing it would be and if we could extend longer commitments to things like the Riverside Art Museum so that they could invest some money in more personnel and more product and, and, and really embrace it because they're ready to do it, but they can't, but it's, it's so tentative that they're, they're not as a nonprofit, you know, not not ready to take just tons of savings out, but, but they're the kind of organization which I think could alleviate a lot of stress on our teachers by taking away that part. At least we wouldn't be making the teachers do art lessons, you know. We, we, could, we can save the teachers. And what we're going to be getting in return is a comprehensive art lesson uh, which is based in, in real uh, art background. So I, I don't know, it's something to consider is a, more of a long-term commitment with these groups. Um, second of all, we, for many years we heard about nutrition and all the good things we were doing in RUSD for the health of our student. I would sure like to have an update on nutrition at some point and hear how the nutrition department is doing and what, what, all those ideas that we were starting to develop, I, I just wondered what happened to them, so I'm just curious. And then I'll echo both uh, Alex's and uh, Angela's comments about the wonderful state of the district, which was one of those really feel-good moments, and I really appreciate uh, everybody who made that come to pass, and thank you, communications, that was great, and Justin, you guys did a great, great job pulling that off. I thought it was very professional. And it really highlighted the district in the best possible light. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Alavi. Trustee Locke Dawson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Ditto, ditto, ditto. I think Justin, and you and your team did a fabulous job. And so did everybody that had a hand in making this happen. For a first time out, I, it was really impressive. So I, you hit a home run. So good job. Um, just very briefly, um, I. Uh, 
attended an event this morning um, with Dr. Farouk and Mr. Hunt, and one of the things that came up there was that often many teachers and many of the staff in our sites don't have an opportunity to get to know our board very well. And they often feel that they, um, in some cases, you know, we aren't approachable. I don't know why, but um, that, and that they would like to know more about us and maybe, so there was a suggestion that perhaps we do some more kind of community outreach events internally with our own staff and at our school sites. And um, I did talk to um, Ms. Hike about that. Um, and I know I, Dr. Um, Hansen, she'll talk to you about that as well. But um, I think it's a great idea and I, I would like to um, suggest that we do a little bit more like that, being out in, in our schools as a board, as a casual conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lock Dawson. Vice President Lee. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hunt. A few things, been a busy couple of weeks. Um, I wanna thank Kylie and, and Dr. Hansen for um, recognizing uh, Casey Finfrock. Um, I went to school with Casey's brother and his brother was one of the most competitive people that I'd ever met yeah. until I met Casey. And um, so Doug, his brother, had set all those records and then Casey came along four years later and shattered all those records. Um, but Casey's one of those, um, the stories that we need to tell. You know, and we're doing a good job, I think, telling our story, but somebody that went to RUSD, his mom's a teacher at Alcott, he chose to go to RCC when he was being recruited by four-year schools, chose to stay locally in Redlands, um, because of their education program, chose to come to RUSD to teach, and, and he's one of our math teachers. Um, so I, I'm glad that uh, we were able to recognize him, and I hope that we can continue to do that when we see our teachers and our staff doing things outside the classroom, being recognized for, for their achievements, not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom. Um, I think that's important that we do that, um, and I think it's all about building that culture that you know, Dr. Hansen's been instrumental in bringing to the district, district when, since he's been here. So thank you for that. Um, speaking of partnerships, I was at the uh, Goes to Walk this, this last weekend, and we have some very, very talented students um, at our various campuses. I saw some, some kids from King, and I recognized them from um, an event the PTA did last year, like Best Day Ever, I can't remember, something like that. And I recognized some of the kids that were performing, and um, they're, just, they're just fantastic. So um, I know that they're, they're really the exception, they're the best of the best, but I'm encouraged when we get together with this, this VAPA coordinator and this VAPA plan to provide those kinds of opportunities for, for more and more kids, because I think we can grow and grow and have more kids um, like I saw at Ghost Walk, so um, congratulations to those kids. Um, I want to thank um, S Steve Kong and, and Steve Dunlap and, and Renee for helping arrange a visit from CyArc, um, who, who um, my brother was here, uh, had visited North and Longfellow and provided virtual reality experience for some newcomer students at North who um, uh, many of them had just been in the country a short amount of time and within a few minutes of putting on these, these, this VR experience, we were able to transport themselves to Mount Rushmore, or to, to Myanmar, or to, uh, or to Corinth in Greece. And so it was really fun, and, and Dr. Farouk was with me to watch these kids um, literally lose their minds, like trying to be too cool for school, like, oh, I'm gonna look silly in this, to just big grins clear across their face, so that was fun. And then we got to experience that with what we thought were 30 kids at Longfellow, turned out to be a little bit of miscommunication. There was 100 kids at Longfellow, but um, we, we got through all of them and they all had a great time. So I, I know it's not easy to get kids out of the classroom and, and take uh, staff people out of, out of their normal work environment to provide that kind of experience, but it's not very often that we get those kinds of opportunities. So when we can be versatile and provide those opportunities, um, I'm appreciative and I know the students are too. Um, also echo some of the things that have been mentioned before about communications. Good job, Justin. Good job, Kristen. Good job, Con. Good job, Mark. Good job, Robert. Um, not just with the State of the District, which was awesome. Um, I'm part of a, a group called Rain Cross Group. So it was Patricia and several, well, every member of the board has been part of that group in the past. Uh, but that was the morning after uh, the State of the District, and everybody was talking about how great it was, trying to figure out how to get that content, how to get that video, how they can use it to help attract. Um, businesses and, and executives to our region how to better tell our story. 
So I, I see the progress. Now I'm hearing the progress out in the community. So what we're doing is working. Um, so good job, communications department. You guys, you guys are doing awesome work um, with whether it's the videos or uh, the, the social media um, or just the events, producing events. The event at King High School, I heard great things. So good job, guys. And then my last last point um, kind of stemmed from the idea of, of what I was hearing after the state of the district about how our, our local businesses and our, and our chamber is still really struggling um, attracting new businesses here or having existing businesses grow. Um, and it's not because of a lack of talent or a lack of opportunity in our schools. It's our test scores. And you know, just like this transition for, for math and, and common core standards, it's going to take a long time to see some, some big strides, even though we're making some good strides uh, in the short term. Um, we have to keep telling our story better. And I think we need to find out. We all have an idea of what we, what we think we need to attract businesses and to attract new people to our schools and you know, make, make RUSD their number one choice and where you know, private and ch charters maybe for special circumstances. So I think it would be a good idea, um, Mr. Hunt and, and the board, if we had maybe an odd, ad hoc committee and try to get together some of these business leaders to tell us what challenges they're having and tell them what can we do as a district to put in their hands, whether it's a video, whether it's an informational um, uh, brochure, um, what needs to be on that brochure, if it's information sessions, if it's uh, us being at certain events, um, if, it's, uh, if it's us providing tours to, to executives and, and business leaders, what is it that we can do to b continue to partner with our business community to show how great our district is and to look beyond the test scores, to look beyond greatschools.org, um, to help really be a good partner because bringing business, bringing business to this community is going to bring, bring business to our school and that's what I think we need. So just something to consider. Um, and I, I know a lot of business leaders that would be willing to serve on that and uh, maybe get communications involved and find out what they need. So we're, we're producing great content, but let's make sure the content that we're producing is what they need and maybe prioritize what they need first so we can tell our story, the story that we want to share with, with the outside. Excellent, Dr. Mr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, from the district, the state of the district is wonderful program. Uh, kudos, Dr. Hansen and your team. Uh, a lot of folks talked to afterwards and got phone calls. It convinced me that everybody wants to, what they really want to do is direct because we've got a lot of ideas on how to change it and how to, all that, which I'll share with Dr. Hansen tomorrow. But uh, I thought it was, out of the gate, it, it was just fantastic. And uh, thank you for the CPR uh, support on all that from the board and, and from the Dr. Hansen's governance team. Um, you know, as, as someone who has a little bit of expertise on heart problems, um, this city, up until very recently, uh, allowed its ambulance service, AMR, to add two minutes. They have to get to you by, by their contract. They have to get to you in nine minutes and 59 seconds. And this city added two minutes for, for the last 10 years. Uh, former Councilman Shavoni and Hart were very much behind that. In exchange for $1.4 million that AMR would give our our city budget, and to me, that's blood money. That's that's my opinion. I don't I don't mind being quoted. Thankfully, uh, Councilmember Davis and Subaru both fought against that. We have more ambulance companies now in, which really took away the monopoly, which took away AM, AMR's uh, uh, situation. But I think what we're doing by training up a, a just generations now of, of young people that will be versed in CPR is we're becoming a much healthier city. And, uh, and I, you know, it's what schools should do. It, it really, we, we are the ones that make the impact. And so I'm very proud of the district for doing that. I did uh, busy Thursday, like we all had, I did go to the Heart Association uh, uh, luncheon or dinner that uh, reception that night, partly because I, I sleep with the woman that was on the committee and uh, she insisted I be there. And, but, uh, and that wasn't Virginia, by the way, but I, Virginia was there and uh, she was very excited to hear about uh, early in the day, the board met when, in the best retreat in my nine years by far, second place isn't even close, uh, on setting their priorities with Dr. Hansen and uh, got to give uh, Damien such a wonderful kudos for his, his work on that. But I told her about the middle college commitment as one of our priorities. She shared with me that 
my guess was right that they intend, they being RCC, D, intend to go for a bond very soon. And so they want to have um, substantive and aggressive, assertive talks with us about the middle college, about, about Central. So the alliances we're, we're building are, are very important. Um, MLK the other night, uh, the, they did a great job, our staff, uh, Mr. Grayson and, and his group, and mixed with the King staff, Mr. West up there, Dr. Hansen, of course, uh, a recognition of public safety night uh, just went off with, uh, of course, whenever you use Bill Withers singing Lean On Me as, as your background music, it's gonna, things are going to be good. So, uh, but Jason recognized the, the important error. Something I noticed as I was standing there was, this, if you look up there, the side of the helmet, one side has the King K, and the other side has, has this, and I thought, well, what? And I thought for a minute the kid's thing had fallen off or something. And then I find out, and I talked to Athletic Director Brown up there and um, one of your classmates, Mrs. Locke Dawson, and this is a, a program that the campus has committed to, and uh, promoting education, athletics at King. And this will be their mission statement, and I'll, and I'll ask Beth if she'll send these things to you in your packet, just some of the things they put together. Some is a little long to read, but... The mission statement is that Martin Luther King High School is committed to excellence in athletics as part of a larger commitment to excellence in education. And it goes on from there, and I, I just want to catch people doing good. And Mr. West and his team up there, uh, and particularly Athletic Director Brown, that's, that's doing good. Um, something that if, if other campuses want to plagiarize it, let's do it, because I, I think it's great. And it really was a, a good program. So kudos to them. Um, I've asked... Uh, um, talk to Mr. Lee about this and Dr. Hansen. Um, I believe that, and I'm going to have a, one of my last acts as president, uh, appoint an ad hoc committee, which means temporary in Greek, I think, that uh, will simply be looking at energy efficiency. Uh, I'm not satisfied, I think we, with, uh, it's called schools, now it's synergistics, but when Rick Miller brought it here, it's been a great program, but I have been, as a board member, I was frustrated with Mr. St. Martin's predecessor that, that I couldn't get anything moving on, on solar, even though four of our campuses are in uh, Southern California Edison Territory. So they are, they are eligible for benefits if you go energy efficiency and solar and some other things that RPU, Riverside Public Utilities, which most of us are in, um, doesn't have. But, uh, but you know, in my private business and working with a, someone uh, on a very unique solar program that the California Energy Commission sort of imposed on the big utilities, I, I began to look at this and, and I, I talked to the folks at Corona Norco about this. It's really a good, really a really good program. It's remote solar that then is credited dollar for dollar right into the account of the, uh, of the school district or, or the public entity. And so in my everyday business, I went and pitched it to Corona Norco and you know, the reason they turned it down, I said, no, you're doing better. Corona Norco is thinking out of the box. I can't hardly believe, they are bypassing Edison and buying their energy directly from the power source in Utah. It's a five-year contract, so, because natural gas is volatile, but they can, you know, can renew and all that. But in the meantime, and, and this program I'm talking about, it, and it's got a crazy name of R-E-S-B-C-T, that's, anyhow. But um, I know it's Retha Franklin's program. But uh, I, one school district we're, we're working with, we're looking at a close to 47% savings on their electrical just in the first year, 1.7 million over 50 million over, and that's a conservative 3%. Corona and Norco, what they're doing it, it, it is so out of the box and, and is even better than that program. And, and I'm saying, why can't we do that? And we have a new team here that Dr. Hansen's assembled that's, can I think can can bring that together? There's there's other programs. Uh, you know, Dr. Hike, Kristen was talking about, and I'm guilty of this. The, the gas company's been trying to work with us for years. I, re, I I see their lobbyist. She wants to give us grants and things. Like any board member, I've got a bad memory with other things happening. But uh, Kristen's already reached out to her. There's other things we can be doing. We can be much more progressive, and and we need to get across to Riverside Public Utilities. We're their second or third largest consumer. UCR is obviously going to be number one. We're going to be behind the city, county, something like that. But 
they they have they have sort of brushed us off for years, and we've got to change that. We this is nine percent of our budget is utilities, and four hundred fifty million. Somebody out there who's better at math, figure that out. That money savings goes right back in general accounts. So this is what Mrs. Locke Dawson and I will be on this committee, and we'll be working with uh, uh, Sergio and 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 Dr. Hansen on, on all of this. And also report, um, I'm disappointed on this, that as you know, we nominated Sandy Page to, to be uh, elected to the county committee to represent uh, Supervisory Area 1, which is Mr. Jeffrey's area, on the reorganiz education reorganization. Uh, unfortunately, we had, to, uh, we had to meet that night, so we couldn't be there to personally advocate. And he's a dear friend of all of ours, but they elected Ben Johnson who next Tuesday will no longer be in office after, after that election. And, I, and I'm disappointed, and I'm going to share that with our uh, Bill Newberry, uh, that, that because it's just, uh, I know Sandy's not in office either, but, but some fresh blood and outlook would, would have been, uh, I, I think, uh, welcoming. Now, um, um, I do want to say, yes, at North today, it was very interesting. I support what Mr. Locke Dawson was saying. Um, and, um, you know, this, we do have a workshop on the 14th, but uh, this is my last regular board meeting as, 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 as your president. I appreciate very much and, and honored to have served you as that. I hope you've been able to handle it. Um, December 5th, we'll have a, our reorganization committee uh, uh, meeting. And unlike certain presidential candidates, I, I will support a peaceful and, and easy transition to, to a new administration. I want you to know that. And I, I won't question the outcome of the vote either. I just want you to know that too. So, um, but uh, I want to say that uh, we talked about this earlier this year. Because the state legislation required us to extend our terms because we had to go to odd, I mean, had to go away from odd years to even years. I've talked about that before. You know, we, this, this board, got an extra year. Two-year terms became three, four-year terms became five. Um, it's, it's my opinion that there isn't a board other than the 1965 board, perhaps, that deserves that one year more. And there isn't a governance team with Dr. Hansen and the people he's put brought to our district that is better prepared to use that extra year. I think we've had a, if it's just Alex alone as a student board member, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna cap it off on Tuesday night and I want to commend those uh, who have volunteered uh, their time, and that would be Dr. Hansen, Mrs. Kadish, Mr. Sergio St. Martin, and, and Haley Calhoun in particular, and I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, Mays, but have really put together a, a great program. Uh, Ophelia Valdez Yeager has, has been, as I knew she would, has, has, has been the great, you know, uh, almost like the wagon train master, getting everybody in gear and getting them in line and moving on. Paul Gill, uh, we had a target of X, and he raised about 100,000 more than X, which, which will, this board will commit to send, send to Reef in our name. And so uh, if you haven't voted, please vote. Oh, please tell your neighbors to vote. It's, it is a great opportunity for our, our district. Uh, Tim Martin's right, you know, great teachers, as I said the other day, great teachers can teach in a refrigerator box if they had to. Uh, modulars aren't much bigger. And why should they? We, we, it, our campuses reflect our community as much as everything we, we do up here. Our campuses reflect our community and, and our commitment, our commitment as citizens uh, to, to K-12 education. So keeping our fingers crossed, um, uh, even with Z on there, I think we've got a darn good chance. And I want to thank Haley and all of you for, for what you've done. And with that, we will meet on the 14th. If there's any items for that agenda, we'll have a little bit of business to cover, some work Mrs. Alavi and I will be presenting to you. But if there's anything else, please let me know. I have a meeting with Dr. Hansen at 2 o'clock tomorrow. And with that, we're adjourned. Oh, Josh. Who's here from North?